Okay, welcome everybody on a rainy Monday or evening, I guess, sorry. Um, hopefully you guys aren't getting washed out up there. I know it's always heavy rain in the North Bay almost always. We just have like <clears throat> light, heavy rain all day today. Okay, we have a few things to, to uh, mention, announcements and then any questions that that engenders for any of you before we get to the first slides. But tonight's topic is one that's, I think it's gotta be interesting to everybody and certainly important uh, in the understanding of uh, world history, world events and so forth, world cultures, uh, but also uh, just because of its uh, uniqueness and that's Islamic architecture. Uh, been to half a dozen Muslim majority, as they say, countries and taken my own slides. And after we finish the must knows, I'll just, uh, we're, we're going to end early tonight, but we'll take both an earlier break and an earlier, but the last, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, as I've done in a few other cases uh, where I have slides that aren't part of the syllabus, you won't have to take any notes on those, will be my own slides of Istanbul and uh, Islamic architecture, as well as some early Christian sites, because if you recall last week, we covered how Istanbul used to be Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, and then it became the capital of the Turkish Empire, and now it's just the biggest city in Turkey. It's a fascinating place. I mean, multiple cultures over many, many centuries have overlapped there, and uh, the, there's evidence for all of those. So we'll just see a few highlights from some of the better slides I was able to take when I was there many years ago. And we'll still end at least, oh, 20 minutes early, I would think, maybe more. Okay, let's um, do speaker view and then just see if anyone has any questions before I uh, give you my announcements or, or make my announcements about uh, due dates and so forth. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions that are urgent on the tip of your tongue here before I, I mention the uh, few announcements and we start today's slides? Anybody? Not yet? Okay. <laughs> As always, I'll stick around afterwards as long as there are questions from anybody um, after the last slide is off the screen. Okay, first and foremost is about your, well, mostly for most of you, your second papers, the due date, just as a reminder, it's not imminent, but it isn't that far away. Um, and that will be coming up before uh, the break. And uh, so for this class, it's Monday, the 22nd of November. Was that three weeks exactly? So I know most of you have not thought about it, but perhaps in the next week before we meet again next Monday, you should at least hopefully have picked a topic so you can start checking for sources for the research for it, if not actually starting to write it. And then of course, if you have a sample of it done as always, as long as you don't wait till less than 48 hours before the due date and give me at least two days or more before you have uh, to turn it in, which is midnight Monday, the 22nd. Uh, if you send me a, a sample of or even a full rough draft, I'll, if you say that you want me to give you feedback and it's not just an early submission of a final draft, you have to stipulate that, otherwise I can't tell for sure then I will give you feedback immediately or you know, within 24 hours in, as to what, if anything, you're missing or need to add. Okay, I still don't have first papers from a few people, but I do think, let's see, now that I have, um, let's see, you know, what I see about the names on the, on the uh, right-hand column is very helpful, but of course, a number of them are, um, you know, abbreviated or otherwise only first and middle names and so forth. So let me, the reason I'm doing this is because I think this is a proactive, I hope helpful, well, it should be helpful um, service, if you want to call it that, for um, people that might have either slightly different registered names or in the case of one person, Jessica Rosales, are you here now? Because I can't see from the list on the side. The reason I'm asking is because I think I finally yeah. Finally figured out that Jessica Rosales is in both my 2.1 and 1.2 class, which has caused me not any confusion, but just a little bit of an uncertainty about, uh, you know, assignments. Um, is she here? Well, I'll make the announcement. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, well, it's just to be helpful because I know you're a very diligent student. And, and in fact, we, I think, right, had a little 
bit of a discussion about the slides in the other 1.2 class earlier today. I, I definitely have both midterms, but I don't at the moment see uh, your first paper from either class. And that's okay. You're not the, I'm not trying, I'm just saying, you know, if that's the case for anybody here in one, or if you're, some people are taking two sections from me in, in the same semester, that's Thank you. I will check it out. Perhaps I send it to another email. Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to do is, is avoid there being any uncertainty because that can happen, in which case it's not a problem if you resend it. If you send it on time, there'll be no points off. If it went to the wrong email, it can happen or it could even have gotten spammed out if your name somehow was any different than the way it's it was uh, written in the uh, roll book when I first you first enrolled. And that's not just it's for everybody. I'm saying that. So I'm not sure what the situation was, but all I can say is at the moment, I don't have a record of receiving uh, the first paper for for you and a few other people and I will just do it say this if you haven't gotten it's true for everybody who may or may not you know if it applies to you um, in any of my classes uh, have gotten a grade back from your first papers because I haven't seen it yet I've graded all the papers that I've, I've been able to log in or that the readers have graded and sent back to me and double check that so it doesn't mean that you know it's a disaster you know or some horribly difficult problem if you send it in earlier and if it was a little bit late it's only five points off if it was a week or more late it doesn't go up it's only 10 points off so if you just haven't had a chance to finish a paper the first paper anybody from tonight's class you can still do that and you have three weeks for the second. I would just try to get that done though now as soon as you can and submit it hopefully before the next class, then you'll have that grade logged into your records and mine, and then you can move on to the second paper. That's my considered advice. However, if you did submit it and I haven't seen it, it's because it went astray somehow, then I would ask that you resubmit it. And here we go, I'll do this again because it does apply to a, several people in this class it's like five i think that i don't yet have a first paper from uh when it comes time for you and this advice to everyone for the second paper which is three weeks of tonight uh if if i don't if i haven't given you a grade back then i didn't see it so you can assume that you need to resend it is what i am saying right now for those that this applies to so, and then we'll move on to another quick announcement and get started with the slides. You know, you, you need to make sure not only is it labeled correctly like this as a course of PDF, uh, and this would be paper number one, if you didn't submit that yet or get a grade from it and you need to resubmit it. Then also last name comma first name and those two names need to be the same as your first and last name that you enrolled with, not you know a middle name or, I know people have hyphen, <laughs> totally understand, hyphenated last names. However you enrolled, you'll know because it was on the enrollment confirmation, the digital confirmation you should have gotten, unless you, well, they're not taking in-person enrollment, are they yet? I don't think so. <laughs> so whatever form it was that you enrolled on, your name, the way it was there is how I have it in my roster is my point, and that's how I log them in. Otherwise, it's not clear always. Sometimes I can guess, but you know, I don't want to have to guess. It's too important, your grade and your, your points that you should be able to 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 earn or will earn when you submit something, even if it is late. Now, if it's just late, it's still not that big a problem because you can make that up if, if it is, you know, a, a, well, it'd be more than a week late now because the first paper is due more than a week ago. Uh, it's only 10 points off and you can make that up with extra credit. And that leads to my next announcement. Hopefully everyone's clear on what I just said about submitting papers or resubmitting them, uh, first papers. If I don't yet give you a grade, that means you need to do that. You need to either go ahead and finish that first paper and then submit it as soon as possible so you don't get caught up in the backlog of your second papers due and then the final plus other other class assignments it, it can uh, pile up so hopefully you can avoid that uh, the other thing on extra credit is um, a new exhibit is opened at the i think it was just last week at the uh de young museum in golden gate park in san francisco where the parking is right there underneath the building so you don't have to worry about i've had a few students mention this it's happened to me if you're on the streets of San Francisco after dark, your car is parked and it's not in a well-lit place, or even if it is, it could get broken into, but not when it's in a secure parking garage where security guards are standing right there at the door to the museum or near, you know, where the elevators are. As you know, if you've been to the De Young, the parking is really convenient right there under the museum. And, uh, and then you can just walk right into the entrance uh, and show your ticket. Um, for 10 points extra credit, you could go see the, uh, 
exhibit there that's um, about, uh, it's called Pastels or From Line to Drawing, I forget the title, but anyway, it's, it's the only exhibit that covers centuries worth of painting and drawing with pastel colors as well as chalk that of course is, is a medium, right, of, of drawing uh, as well as painting. And it covers things like uh, Impressionism and um, I think even early Renaissance art as, and then uh, more modern art. So it may not overlap with the syllabus topics that we are covering historically in, in, in the chronological period, time period that we're covering in this ancient to medieval art class. But it doesn't matter, extra credit for any museum, exhibit, exhibit, uh, a museum, sorry, exhibit of art, of visual art, qualifies for 10 points extra credit. You can do that twice, twice in this semester, two different museums, of course, two different exhibits. So that's something you might want to take a look at. Uh, and then there's, um, there's other museum exhibits you can check out on your own, of course. So last Time now before we start tonight's lecture on Islamic art. Are there any questions that anyone has right now about grades or extra credit or papers? Nope, okay, well, I'll ask again at the end. All right, let's get started then with uh, the first slide and Islamic architecture, here we go. Make sure you guys can see this, get rid of that and move this up out of the way. <clears throat> okay, because Islamic architecture is just one of the many art forms Muslim culture is famous for. <clears throat> uh, but uh, it's important to give context because Islamic architecture was ahead in terms of techniques and artistic quality and even innovative, you know, methods of construction and, and uh, design ahead of medieval European architecture for centuries. Now that changed when you get to Romanesque and Gothic cathedrals, which are the last two topics we do cover in this class. But the Islamic world was not in the dark ages. As many of you know this if you study world history or have an interest in that part of our uh, global history, which is that they were in a golden age, really. Most of the Muslim cultures from the time of Muhammad, or at least after he established an era, was then an Arabic empire, all the way through at least the late Renaissance, the uh, you know more advanced architecturally, certainly in architecture, and, and some would say only in architecture, but even that, that's a pretty important field, but also in learning in other areas besides visual arts, uh, in, in uh, scholarship and technology, the more advanced cultures uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere were in the Middle East, you know, and around the Mediterranean areas where Muslims controlled uh, one way or another. First, it was the Arabic Empire, and then it was uh, the you know, Persian in essence, and, and then it became the Turkish Empire. These were different successive groups. We're going to talk about them as we go along with the slide. So the point is that they were an advanced civilization and they introduced things that now you should have your list of terms to know in front of you because on the uh, final, remember the final is not cumulative, so it's only everything from last week's lecture forward from early Christian art on. But any of these slides, I can tell you right now, there's no question that one of the Muslim architecture slides at least, if not two, will appear on either the slide essay part of the final and or slide ID. But I wanted you to see the list of things invented by Muslims. Okay, uh, we only have one standalone definition, but this could appear on the true false section of the final. Remember that was there was a true false section, of course, on the midterms will be very similar. And it might say um, something like uh, things invented, oops, I forgot the G. <laughs> Thins. Okay, it was late at night when I made it. Things invented by Muslims include the following, and then I might list three or four, but if one of them is wrong and it's not from this list, then that is a false statement. If any part of it's false, the whole thing's false. You, you, you should have, uh, I'm sure, recall that from the way I did that with the terms I used in the true false section on the midterm. Same procedure. Both tests are worth, have the same number of slides and worth the same number of points. So here we go, just briefly uh, touching on universities. You might say, I remember thinking that when I was taught this back in, I took Islamic art, art history at Cal Berkeley many decades ago. It wasn't as prominent a subject as it is now. Um, but I remember thinking, what? The professor told us universities. 
were invented by Muslims. Well, in the sense of an institution of multiple disciplines being taught by experts, at least supposedly, right? In each field, all under the same roof. Well, we don't mean literally under the same roof. Obviously, universities, I mean, I don't know any. Well, Berkeley City College, and Berkeley is not a university, of course, has, has one building, you know, but that's rare. Of course, we're talking about in one institution, the phrase under one roof, of course, you understand. So under one roof in one location, all gathered together in one place. That's what it means, universe universities, a universe of knowledge, of learning. That idea first appears in the Western world, at least, i.e., you know, the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and North America, and South America, i.e., the Western world, quote, unquote, in those parts of the globe we call the Western world. It first appears, the universities, in Muslim cities. There were no universities in Europe in the 8th, 9th, 10th century. By the 12th century, yes, there were a few, and soon after the you know, late Middle Ages, you began to see universities all over Europe, but not in the Dark Ages, which is what Europe was in after the fall of Rome, as you recall, except for the areas briefly reconquered, well, it was 100 years that re reconquered and occupied by the Byzantines, but they didn't have universities either. They had academies, just like the Romans and the Greeks did, as you may no, from Greek and Roman history. I don't think I use that word, but those were, you know, maybe areas of large groupings of, of uh, knowledge within a certain set of related fields. But that's not the same thing as a university, at least the true definition of university is every subject that is, you know, teachable, you know, or has experts that are available to teach, known to, you know, that culture at that time is taught in one place under one roof at one time. That idea uh, first appears in Western culture in Muslim cities. So you can say they invented the concept of modern university street lighting. You might think, well, didn't the Romans? Well, yes and no. They had street lighting, but it was limited to either the wealthier or more important neighborhoods. And it wasn't usually maintained by a city government, which then made sure that lights, street lighting worked in every, on every street in every neighborhood and was a, a responsibility of the municipal uh, rulers you know, the local government, that, that concept, again, first appeared in the Western world in Islamic cities. The, the streets of uh, Mecca and Medina in the seventh century, the 600s were lit by, uh, you know, well-maintained street light systems. Okay, and then reflecting pools, we're gonna talk about that. Literally, what are they? Well, you'll wait and you'll see when we get to a close-up slide of one, but they're, of course, all over the world now. They first appeared in Islamic uh, in front of an Islamic mosque. Higher algebra, and that's, you know, the Greeks invented algebra, yes, but higher algebra, the kind that you're often required to take and not always pleasantly so for some people if you don't like math, but at least last, I know my daughter was required to take it, higher algebra in high school to get her diploma and often, it, if not, then in college before you get your AA uh, is, is a, a branch of mathematics that again, was developed by Muslim scholars and well, mostly those universities. Minarets, we'll talk about those are, of course, some of you already know, uh, and that actually will give you a definition because it's part of the meaning of the uh, one of, or two of the slides tonight. And finally, pointed arches, again, an architectural detail, which doesn't need a definition, but those most people associate with Gothic architecture, Gothic cathedrals, which is what most Gothic churches are, are built on the principle of pointed arches. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But the idea of the shape of a pointed arch is a Muslim invention. Okay, so let's get started with the first must know slide tonight. And that's this one we're looking at, the dome of the rock, or just dome, you have to write the word the dome of the rock, Jerusalem, which of course, some of you know, is the largest city and well, technically the capital of Israel now, J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M, Jerusalem, 691. Now, all these dates are common error. I think I said that. So you have to write A-D or C-E after. So why is this so important? It looks like a small mosque out in the middle of nowhere, maybe on some the edge of some uh, Arabic village. Actually, none of the above. First of all, it may not be as large as some of the more famous mosques, but it is one of the most important Muslim sites in the world. And here's the reason why. It is the second oldest mosque in the world. The oldest is only a few hundred yards away on the same plaza. 
And that one we aren't covering because I don't want to confuse you. Uh, I have my own slides, but we'll just say it's one of the two oldest mosques and therefore it is actually the second oldest mosque in the world. That's right there enough reason to make it important to world culture, not just to Islamic history. The, the other thing about it is it's the third holiest site to uh, Muslims anywhere in the world. So it's the third holiest site in the world to all Muslims. And I'll explain why in a minute. That's pretty important, those two facts are, you know, two of the main reasons why we're studying it. Okay, so what about this mosque makes it, you know, so important? Well, let's start with the fact that it's got a golden dome. And yes, what looks like gold is gold here. That is real gold, which is replaced about every 20 years. You could say once a generation or you know, every couple of decades, however you want to write that. But it's, I think it's about every 20 years when gold wears out, you know, of course, in the weather. So it has to be replaced by different Arab governments pay for that each time. Yeah, somebody had a question? Where, oh, okay. Yeah, well, <clears throat> if you want to ask one for the whole group, go ahead, do a raised hand or a verbal comment. All right, the point is that gold, what looks like gold really is gold. And it's replaced about every 20 years by various Arab governments take turns paying for that. Okay, that's one thing that marks it as unique. Another is it has no minaret, which is very unusual. Mosques almost always have minarets. You're seeing about, uh, the, the, the top of another minaret from the oldest mosque in the world, which sits behind this one in Jerusalem on the same plaza. Okay, but that's not from this mosque. So this mosque is one of the few in the world with no minaret. Now, why don't we go ahead and say what a minaret is? You're going to see them more clearly in association with the, uh, a couple of the other mosques we're going to look at in the slides in the next couple hours or so. So a minaret, it's pretty simple. It's a tall, narrow, round prayer tower. Everyone I've seen is round. So tall, narrow, round prayer tower at or near the corner of a mosque. There's no other way to say that really accurately. So almost every other mosque in the world has a minaret, but this one is so early that they didn't either have one or it was somehow lost, torn down, whatever, or knocked down perhaps by, it could be earthquakes, it could be weather, but it probably never had one. I've seen illustrations of this mosque going back to, oh, the earliest explorers from say, you know, Europe uh, to come here. Oh probably eight, several hundred years ago, and it didn't have a minaret then, but perhaps it originally did. And just say right now it doesn't have a minaret. And so it's one of those rare mosques with no minaret. However, it has everything else that marks a mosque as uh, traditional Islamic architecture. So let's take a closer look at this view. I might use this on the uh, exam if it's on the uh, slide uh, analysis part. Well, actually, yeah, right. Because you can see the detail a little better, but it's an unusual angle. Uh, usually you see it in all the other photos is straight on, dead, dead set on. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say, what is it about it before we get to the details, which is the other part of the meaning, you know, that what are there three features that make this a traditional example of a Muslim mosque architecture? But one thing it's missing, I already said, is you can see there's no minaret here. Okay, but why is it the third most important site to Muslims in, in the entire world? Because the mosque, this mosque, was built over a, a large boulder. See, it's not really a rock, but it's something like something you could pick up and throw. It's huge. I've been inside this mosque twice. Uh, it was built over a very large boulder, or you could say huge rock if you prefer, which Muslims believe was the spot from which Muhammad ascended to heaven when he died on the back of his winged white horse. Now, that's literally the only way to write it because that's part of their religious beliefs, uh, which is, you know, like Christians believe Jesus, well, some do anyway, came to life three days after he died, you know, however you think that's your business, but that's what's being, you know, stipulated that what this mosque was done, uh, I mean, it was built of and why it was built it, and makes it the holy, third, sorry, third holiest site to all Muslims is that Muslims believe that the rock over which it was built is the spot from which Muhammad, I'll say it again, ascended to heaven 
on the back of his white winged horse. He, he was on a, according to their teachings, a magic horse that he and the horse went to heaven. It's an interesting image. From that rock ascended directly. So the, this mosque was built not too long after that over that rock. Now, if you're curious, I bet some of you are, it looks awfully good condition for something 1300 years old. Yeah, it's had to be restored a lot. The outer walls have been almost totally replaced as I already said, the gold on the dome has, and even the drum of the dome here, this part, right? However, the walls, the inner walls, the structure is original. So that's how at least uh, you could, you could uh, you don't have to write that. It's more detailed than you need to know. But it is important to know that why it's considered the third holiest site, why it's called the Dome of the Rock. Okay, let's uh, do the rest of the meaning about the features. Yeah, here we go. Welcome. We were just starting with the first no slide, which is Dome of the Rock, right? It's first on your list for week 12. Jerusalem, 691. I already discussed why it's it's called the Dome of the Rock, so I'm going to recap that, but you'll see that if you want to watch the video of it on YouTube after 8 p.m. on Friday. But let's let's uh, go ahead with the rest of the meaning. The three features, this is really important to the meaning of this slide, which is a high probability of being on either the I, slide ID or slide essay part of the final. The three features that mark it as a traditional mosque stylistically, architectural features, are pointed arches. You can see them here right? That's a Muslim invention. They didn't exist before Muslim architects came up with them. If you're curious, well, what's the difference between those and Gothic arches? Well, we'll get to that later, but I'll just briefly give you a, a preview. Gothic arches are used to support the weight of the building above them. These are not. They're purely decorative. So the Muslims just use them for decorative purposes, but still the idea of a pointed arches is a Muslim invention. So all mosques I've ever seen have pointed arches somewhere on the exterior, of course, doors or windows, or even purely decorative motifs. And then the other features that mark it as a classical uh, uh, mosque architecture are Islamic prayers in Arabic done in tile work. You don't have to say that, but that's what it is if you want to add that. But there you always decorative tile work at somewhere near the top or on the outer walls, you'll see Islamic prayers in Arabic on the exterior of every mosque. And then finally, this is the most interesting, no living creatures, no images, I should say, of living creatures anywhere inside or out. It's forbidden by Islamic religious teaching. As some of you may know this, right? That what you have is this um, concept that uh, Muhammad um, is you know, himself too sacred. So even he can't be depicted as founder, but that Allah, i.e. God is, the only one to whom creating life uh, in terms of, you know, creating whole new species and life in a broader sense of the word, uh, literally has the power, only Allah has the power to create life. So therefore it's a sin for humans to try and imitate that by drawing images, any kinds of images, not just on mosques. There are exceptions though. That's what's, you know, if you go to Turkey and you go to one of those wonderful museums, which I'll show you the outside of the greatest museum of Islamic art in the world, it's in Istanbul. Um, you might find, you will actually, you'll find beautiful line drawings of all kinds of, you know, and you'd say, well, does that violate? The, well, they're not mosques illustrations. They're not tiles on the outside or painting or fresco or, or mosaics on the inside or outside of a mosque. So I'll say it again. The third feature that all mosques have in common that this does too is no images of living creatures of any kind inside or out. You can see that here. It's all geometric. So what do they allow? Geometric patterns uh, of various kinds of decorative detail uh, such as these here, you know, and plants. Plant motifs are okay. All right, by Muslim teaching. So now I think we've covered the whole meeting. So formal analysis is completely balanced left to right. I'm going to just make a quick decision here. Yeah, I'll use this image because see that one's a little faded, even though it's, it's a more traditional view. So it is symmetrical left to right, but of course you can tell, obviously unbalanced towards the bottom. Uh, there's the rhythm of the pointed arches, the columns, and all the decorative tile, the geometric patterns in the Arabic prayers. 
uh, even on the drum. Uh, then the largest um, mass is the outer walls. Consider that a single mass. And then the dome and then the drum. Remember, a dome on drums. That's, that's something they, they borrowed from Roman architecture. But nobody was building dome buildings in Europe after uh, the uh, fall of Rome, at least in Western Europe, uh, except the Muslims. They were in Spain when they conquered Spain and uh, Sicily when they conquered you know, part of Italy and North Africa. So you have to write that. You can just say that the dome is the second largest uh, mass after the outer walls and third largest would be the drum in between, of course. Then we have the rhythm, of course, the pointed arches and the Islamic prayers and geometric patterns uh, all along the outside. The, the textures are all real smooth texture of marble and tile. And yes, there is glass in the windows, but you notice you can't, yeah. Th these are not kind of windows you can look out of. They don't want you looking outside when you're inside praying. You're not supposed to look out. There are some mosques where you can see a little bit you know, around the side or edges of, of say, some kind of a, a window on at ground level, but that's rare. Most mosques, you have no visible view of the outside. So that's deliberate. However, there is glass in the window. So real smooth textures, well, actually four textures visible here. Real smooth marble, real smooth tile, real smooth glass, and yes, real smooth gold on the dome. Colors are warm on the dome, and a little bit in some of the tile is yellow. Or yellowish colors, but most of the rest of the building below the dome is, is cool, cool blues and whites and grays, as is the marble. It may look warm in a way, but that's just discoloration. It's, it's kind of an off-white grayish color marble. Uh, the modeling is just shadows in the sun, mostly around the pointed arches in the, in the entryway or doorway. Uh, for space, it's one large open room, hexagonal, six-sided, you can say, or hexagonal. So it's one large open six-sided room with a dome about 60 feet high. In fact, it is, I think, almost exactly 60 feet from the floor to the top of the dome. Um, and it is stable on the outer walls and dynamic on the pointed arches and the dome. Uh, and then line here is actually painted and drawn. The tile work itself is painted and visual at the corners or edges. All architecture is visible line, but not visual, sorry, I meant visual lines at the edges from the shadows of the sun. But not all architecture has painted line, but all mosques do because of the tile work. Okay, here we go, moving on. This is the next mosque snow. And this one is um, Great Mosque at Cordoba. And Cordoba is C-O-R- D-O-B-A, Great Mosque at Cordoba. The location is Spain and the date is 786. Okay, well, let's start with what is a great mosque? This any large building that where, where Muslims worship? No, it's more specific. A great mosque is the most important and usually the largest mosque in any given Muslim city, or you should say any given city, I'm sorry, because it could be in cities that aren't even a majority, like Paris and London both have great mosques. I'll say it again, um, that a great mosque is the most important and usually the largest mosque in any given city. Now, Cordoba, that's really, really important. Part of the meaning of this slide is where is Cordoba? Well, it's in Spain. And Spain, as you may know now, is almost entirely a Catholic country, right? Well, it wasn't during the Middle Ages. And if you don't know this, you should uh, definitely write this part of the meaning. The Moors, that's M-O-O-R-S, were North African Muslim tribe that invaded Spain. And they then conquered and occupied most or parts or most, you could say. It, it varied. They, they, they you know, rose and fell when they fought the Christian army. So just say they ruled either part or most of Spain. There we go. For eight centuries. That's a long time. They left behind major monuments like this one, this mosque. It's no longer a functioning mosque. It's a museum, an historic site open to the public. Um, so I'll say it again that the Moors, and I already spelled that for you, from North Africa invaded Spain 
actually, you don't have to know when, but for those who carry, it's 711, that's an easy thing to remember, you know, in the early Middle Ages. They invaded Spain and then they ruled parts or all of Spain for the next eight centuries. And this was the most important mosque, the great mosque in the capital, their first capital, when they ruled almost all of Spain. Their capital was Cordoba, uh, which this city was for centuries, the capital of Moorish Spain, the kingdom of Moorish Spain. And that's how universities were introduced as well as other Muslim architectural features. The first universities in Europe were in Spain introduced by the Moors in Spanish cities. By the way, they allowed Christians and Jews to attend them. Very enlightened, right? And this is, we're talking about the early and mid middle ages now. Okay, so this is a mosque. We already mentioned that a mosque is obviously an Islamic house of worship. And yes, it has, I've, I've seen this mosque outside there. I think it's two or three minarets. In any case, we don't see them here. So you wouldn't have to write about that. What you would want to write about are the Moorish influences of the candy stripe arches, see they're brick and stone, of red and alternating red and white stripes. And it was the pattern it creates. Candy striping is what they call it, like candy canes is what one of my students said years ago. And then also another Moorish influence, which by the way, spread from North Africa all the way across the Muslim world. These, you know, candy striped or red and white striped arches was um, the is horseshoe, sorry, I meant to say horseshoe shape. See, look carefully and you'll see it curves in on itself. So it's a, it's a very unusual shape of arch. The Romans and the Greeks, well, the Greeks didn't use arches. The Romans and uh, the Byzantines didn't do those kind of arches. And neither did the later Gothic architecture of uh, France and Europe. So I'll say it again that the second feature of uh, introduced by Moors into, into uh, Spain in this mosque is one of many examples. Uh, were horseshoe shaped arches. You can just say horseshoe arches. Well, if you do two above each other, it's called the piggyback effect. You get a stronger, let's take a look closely. You see this here? That arch helps support the weight of the arch above it. So you don't have to get, I know, too technical in your notes, but you just want to say they also used in this and many other Moorish mosques and, and otherwise later, you can just say in other parts of the Muslim world, a piggyback effect or technique is a better word, piggyback technique where one arch is above another supporting the same part of the, of the roof, right? The roof above is very heavy. So this was the prayer room. That's the other part of the meaning. The great prayer room, well, there really is only one main, so you can say main prayer room in which thousands, I think it was five, but you don't have to have a number, to say thousands of worshipers could pray together at the same time. And this therefore was the largest mosque in the Moorish capital of Moorish Spain called Cordoba. It was both the most important mosque and the largest in that city. But that leads to, I think it's the only other definition for tonight, you know, I kept on this brief for this lecture, which is Mirab and Qibla. So let's see. You can't quite see it from here. You can get a hint of it, but I think at this point, I don't have another closer view. Yeah, I don't. But let's do this. Just I'll just keep the arrow pointed to what that is, but you just need to write the definition. You don't need to, you know, mention where in this photo, if this is on the final, in the essay part of the final. But you would want to mention as part of the meaning of this slide. What is Mirab and Qibla? And that's, uh, it's on your, your list of terms and notes. You should have the spelling right in front of you, right? Mirab, M-I-H-R-A-B and, and second word, Qibla, Q-U-I-B-L-A. The Mirab is the niche in the wall of a mosque that points in the direction of Mecca. I think everybody knows Mecca is the, is the holiest city to Muslims. And all 1.8 billion or so, nearly 2 billion Muslims, when they pray, are supposed to face, turn in the direction of or face Mecca. So how do you know where? There's no windows, right? And they wouldn't have had compasses. At least most people wouldn't. If there were compasses, only highly educated people would have them, rulers and things. So how do you know which direction is Mecca? You don't have to guess. You look for the niche in the wall of that mosque, and then you know that's the direction. So I'll say it again. A mirab means the niche, it is. Uh, the niche in the wall of a mosque that points in the direction of Qibla, which is Me or Mecca. And Mecca 
is Qibla. Those terms overlap, if you're almost synonymous with each other. The holy direction you're supposed to face is, is Qibla. It's just the word they use to describe that concept, that that's the direction you're supposed to turn in, Qibla, the holy uh, direction towards Mecca. So the two words have to be used uh, simultaneously. They're, they're, they're linked. I'll say again, therefore, a niche a mirab in the wall of Hamas points toward Qibla for the direction of Mecca, the holiest city, where you face when you pray. Okay, that's uh, most almost all the meaning, except for one more thing. Some of these columns, the older looking ones that are a little more chipped here, right? Like this one, and the ones that are more worn down because some of them are more recent. The old, just say that many of the oldest columns uh, supporting the, the ceiling in this mosque, or well, it's really the roof, were taken from ruined Roman temples, which is true of almost every culture when they conquer something. They take, like, you know, when the Spanish took over and destroyed, uh, right, the, the Aztec capital, we, we covered that already. They built on top of the ruins of Templo Mayor and even used some of the stonework to build their cathedral. Mm -hmm in that same part of Mexico City. So it just seems to be a common practice by conquerors. So of course, this, they were conquerors. There's no other way to put that. Uh, but they were enlightened conquerors by comparison with some of the other types of cultures that were invading other neighbor countries. When the Moors took over Spain, they, they allowed Christians and Jews to continue worshiping in their own houses of worship and even to have certain you know, positions and influence, not rulers, but, you know, bureaucrats and lawyers and things that were often allowed, even non-Muslims to enter the professions, many of them, not all professions, but some of the more important ones. That's very enlightened for the early mid Middle Ages. Okay, so they did the raid, if you want to say, or take or expropriate. Here we go, cultural expropriation. Um, appropriation, sorry. They took these columns from some of them, some, not all. I, I don't know what percentage, but it's more than a handful. So just say many of them were taken from the ruins of Roman temples. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. Let's go back to the view if it's, that you'll have this soul, full view of the entire you know, slide if it's on the exam. Uh, the rhythm is obvious. The columns, the uh, candy striping on the arches and the arches themselves, you know, the, the rows of of uh, horseshoe shaped arches and that have one above the other that creates powerful rhythm that draws your eye, sorry, all the way down to the end of this prayer room. For space, you have one large open room that can hold thousands of people with about 15 foot high ceiling. It's not a very tall ceiling in this prayer room. There's some mosques with high ceilings. Well, domes, of course, dome mosques, but this is not a domed mosque. Domes are not, I hope you didn't get the idea, I didn't say that, but just in case you might have gotten that impression that domes are common to many or most mosques. No, they were in, in, in quite a few mosques, but they're not a, a basic element of all mosque architecture. They're just very often found in mosques. This one didn't have a dome. It did have minarets though. Okay, and then we have the colors cool almost everywhere except for the red painted bricks on the candy striping arch. Everything else is a cool gray color. Textures are the real smooth texture of marble on the columns and real rough texture of brick and stone. Brick on the arches and stone on the floors. Uh, the largest mass would be, well, we can't see the, the ceiling, but it would probably be the ceiling because of the curves. The ceiling itself is curved, by the way, if that's not obvious. And that would add weight to the ceiling that the floor being flat doesn't have as great. So I would say the masses are in this order. The ceiling is the largest mass, then the floor, uh, then the double arches, and then the columns, because they're not very tall. They're not even 10 feet tall. <coughs> okay, so they'd be the fourth largest mass. Uh, we already mentioned rhythm. Oh, dynamic on the arches. Uh, stable on everything else. Well, actually, the ceiling is curved, so sorry. Sorry, I misspoke. It's, it's, it's dynamic on the arches and the curved ceilings. Stable on the columns and the floor, so about equal parts. It's balanced. Always, a mass, every mass I've ever seen is symmetrical, left to right. And um, you could say it's, it's balanced top to bottom, unless you count this mass here. You can see that's empty space, if it's not obvious as uh, heavier than the floor below it. I'd see it as roughly balanced top to bottom as well as left to right. 
Shadows here in the modeling is natural shadows in the sunlight. They're just created by the sunlight coming through the windows. There are windows here, but they're too high to, to look out of. And line here is um, visual. That's not uh, line. That, that's just alternating colors. So there's no painted or, or uh, drawn line. There's a little bit of carved line on top of the columns, as you can see if you get up close. You could mention that. So some limited carved line, but most of it just visual line around the edges of the arches. Okay. Um, rhythm space. I think we mentioned right, repeated shapes. Texture. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is the next must know on under week week uh, 12. And this is the Great Mosque at Isfahan. Great Mosque at Isfahan. That's I S F A H A N. And the location is Iran, which today many people, well, most people still say Iran, but Persia is the traditional name. Back then it would have been called Persian, but we'll, we'll use the current name of that country where it's located, Iran, 1300. Again, Great Mosque at Isfahan, I-S-F-A-H-A-N, location Iran, date 1300. Okay, so if you're looking at this, it's an unusual view. And it was the best of what I could get that, you know, isn't blocked from the internet. Um, because I think what is important about, there are three things about this mosque that are especially uh, creative, you could say original, yeah, original about this mosque. You might, for instance, notice that there's no visible minaret. Now that's because of earthquakes. Iran, as you may know, if you don't already, uh, inevitably sometime in the next decade, there'll be another big earthquake. They have one about every 10 years or so. So this mosque, which is in one of the holiest cities in Persia, which today is of course Iran. It's a very holy city. It'd be you know almost the equivalent of like Rome to, uh, to, to Catholics, um, but it isn't as, as important as Mecca. So just say it's one of the holiest cities in uh, to Muslims, of course in Iran because of all of the uh, really beautiful mosques and the scholars that uh, and universities. There's, I think, more than one university there. I'm sure there is. So the universities and the high concentration, you can say, or high population of scholars, Muslim scholars, you know, historians and, and religious figures in that city create a very important role for the city of Isfahan. It's one of the, I think it's one of the two old, holiest cities uh, in all of Iran. But it's also the birthplace of a new feature. The minarets, in other words, is missing a minaret in this view. Now there is a minaret on the other side of the courtyard and I never seem to get to be able to find a photo of it. So it originally had at least two minarets. It could have even had four. That's the most you ever see in a mosque. Uh, but the point is that whatever there were originally, the two on this end, just write it this way, the two uh, minarets that once graced this side of the mosque, you know, would have been, of course, probably, they could have been right here, right, rising up off of the uh, ground here from the ground on up, or they could have been in the back corner, it doesn't matter, near at or near the corner of a mosque, right, there's a tall, narrow, round prayer tower is a, mo is a uh, minaret. Those minarets were destroyed in an earthquake. I think it was way back, like in the, you could just say the late Middle Ages, or within a few hundred years, a, a few decades, sorry, a few decades after the mosque was built, at least some of the minarets, the ones on this end in the, would have been there in the photo, were destroyed and never rebuilt. So instead, they built something very different, a prayer tower. Now, see, it's being restored here. With Christian crosses. Now, I had one student say, what? No, that's not Christian cross. It does at a glance look like it, but obviously it would not be on a mosque. Those are just geometric patterns in tile, but it's in lieu of the ma of the minaret. Instead, they replaced, because the earthquakes would have probably just knocked down the new minarets within a few more decades. So rather than rebuild the minarets, uh, it's rather unusual, but it's not the only mosque where I've seen this. Uh, you, you, you would see in this case from 
hundreds of years ago, they replaced what once were the minarets that were destroyed in an earthquake with a small prayer tower. Well, it's not that small, but just say, you know, it would fall down in an earthquake, of course. Uh, and so that would have been where the imam, you know what a minaret right, is used for. And if it's not obvious, you should write this. Uh, a holy, um, well, it would have been a man. There's no question it would have been a man. A holy man, an imam, appointed by the uh, you know local religious authorities to run a mosque sort of like a you know high-ranking priest or even a, uh, a cardinal right or bishop or I should say a bishop in a catholic church you know a high-ranking official who ran a mosque sometimes more than one would climb supposed to be had to be pretty healthy the stairs, oh yeah, that's the only way to get up here, stairs to the top of a minaret, or in this case, to the prayer tower, and call the prayer five times a day. That's what a minaret is supposed to be used for. I think I mentioned that with my slides of Egypt, pretty sure. So the same thing happened with this prayer tower. But then we have the first use, or the oldest use, if not the first, it's one of. So just say one of the oldest examples of a reflecting pool. Reflecting pools are an invention of not only Islamic architects, but specifically Persian architects. Persian architects invented reflecting pools to be placed in front of mosques and later on other public buildings, such as universities and, you know, uh, town halls, right? We call them city halls today. Uh, and then later, reflecting pools are used all over the world. And when we get to the last slide, the most important and maybe interesting slide of all tonight is the last one in India, the Taj Mahal. There's a lot to say about the meaning of that. Um, I will remind some of you or see if any of you remember, uh, where's the most famous reflecting pool in the United States? Some of you already know what I'm talking about, which was inspired by Muslim mosque architecture. <laughs> interesting. I'll give you a clue. It's in Washington, D.C. We'll get to that on the last slide notes. Okay, so let's say a little more about the meaning and then we'll do a formal analysis and we'll take an early break. Um, okay, so what do we see this traditional mosque architecture that isn't unique to this particular or specific to the Persian inventions like the, the prayer tower and the reflecting pool, which by the way is marble, black marble. It, do, it doesn't look like that here. I guess they haven't cleaned the water up. It looks like it's got moss in it. But it, it normally is clear. And I've seen pictures of it on videos and things and travel programs and stuff. Uh, I've never been to Persia, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> I always wanted to go, but might have to wait a while. Anyway, so the, that's a black marble basin, right? Which creates a reflecting pool. And of course it's fed by underground pipes. If it's not obvious, not just the rainwater, otherwise it would be you know, empty half the year. So it's continually kept full by pipes under, that go underground to feed it with water. So it's a black marble basin with usually clear water and it reflects the building in front of it. Uh, Okay, so then what do we see here? We see the same things we saw with the Dome of the Rock, but it's part of the meaning. Again, if it was on the these, uh, slide essay part, you'd have to write this as, to get full credit. So I'll repeat that briefly. Plus, I think we had one or two people join us later than the first part of the first slide. So I'll recap quickly. All mosques have these features in common. Pointed arches, which is an Islamic invention, and these are little prayer rooms where individual uh, uh, worshipers or whole families can go and worship, pray, or maybe even you know mourn over the loss of a loved one. So these are prayer rooms, and each one of which has pointed arches. Pointed arches are a Muslim invention found on all mosques. Then we have the tile work, which I think this is the closest we can get, yeah. The tile work never depicts living creatures. This may look like, and I thought it was, but someone told me it's not a dove or some other kind of a bird-like creature. It's more of a geometric symbol. So what is allowed if no living images, I mean, of living creatures are ever allowed on a mosque, the two things that are, are both present here. Arabic, uh, I should say Islamic prayers in Arabic, that's the way to say it, and those are, uh, visible only around the arch itself. You'd have to stand there and look up at them to see them. And inside in the dome, it's a dome building. It's beautiful inside. I've seen documentaries on this building. So there are um, Islamic prayers in Arabic on all mosques in tile. And then all the other tile work is just geometric patterns or plant motifs. I believe this has, yeah, flowers. There's a different flower motifs here. 
you know, flowers, leaves, vines, that, that's acceptable, but not living creatures as in animals or humans or any holy figures, never allowed on the interior or exterior of Ma. So this is traditional in that regard, all those three features that we covered with the Dome of the Rock are also found here. Okay, uh, so let's do a formal analysis and then take an early break. And uh, like I said, we'll end a oh, good half hour early tonight, but we do still have three really important slides at least highly possible or pro probable one of the last three will be on the uh, final. Taj Mahal, for example, is very high on that list of possible slides for the final. Okay, wrapping up on this slide, it is completely symmetrical. As you can see, left to right, all Moscow, I've never seen one that wasn't, but you'd have to say unbalanced toward the bottom weighted because of the width of these uh, rooms, these prayer rooms. Um, and of course, the narrowness of not only the upper half of the facade, but that prayer tower. Um, I wouldn't count the reflecting pool as part of the moss, but you could count it in a way because it's part of this slide. So if you want to say the largest mass is the reflecting pool, it actually would be. It goes all the way across this large courtyard. So you could say that's the largest mass, then the entryway, and then the two wings, you know, on the left and right. Last but not least, I guess the fourth largest mass would be the prayer tower. Okay, and then for line, here you've got a lot of line. It's painted though, not carved, right, uh, out of the uh, tile. It's painted on the surface of the tile. And so painted line is present all around the entrance, the prayer rooms, and uh, every part of the decorative detailing, including on the inside. This, this looks like, what's well, a giant pointed arch, obviously, it's the entryway. The dome is behind this. Well, that's not the actual dome. You have to walk through the entrance. Uh, so inside, there's also the same repeated, you know, shapes and, and painted line is used inside and out, always, almost always on a glaze tile, of course. But there's also visual line. Don't forget that. The visual line here is, is uh, what's formed by the shadows around the edges of the uh, pointed arches in these niches. There are, of course, niches in the prayer rooms. And so that's where the modeling is. It also shows underneath the main entry arch. So it's all natural uh, modeling from the sunlight, the shadows created by the sunlight. Um, the texture is the real smooth texture of tile. Here it's wood. And I think this is a smooth kind of wood, as I recall. Yeah, that, that I've seen I can see close up views of this documentary. So that, you know, polished, you can say, or sanded wood is smooth. Um, I don't know if there's windows, I can't remember that, but just say what we can see here are real smooth tile textures and a real smooth uh, a wood texture on the um, prayer room and real smooth marble on the reflecting pool. Color is mostly cool, right? Blues and whites with a little bit of yellow worked into the geometric patterns here. I believe some of the flower motifs are yellow as well, but mostly it's blue and white, therefore mostly cool. This is definitely the case with the blue and white tile on the prayer tower. The wood on the prayer tower is a warm, real uh, color. And then it's neutral. Actually, you can see if you look carefully. There we go, right. There we go down to the bottom. Black marble, of course, black is neutral on the reflecting pool. Okay, um, and then it's dynamic on the pointed arches and the entryway, right? But almost everything else is stable, right? I mean, some of the decorative patterns of the edges of the, the borders, I might say, borders do, do form curved lines. But most of the tile work is, at least from this distance in this photo, uh, pretty much stable. And the whole building is stable, right? Right angles everywhere you look, except possibly the, the top of the, the peak, if you want to call that, of the prayer tower. And the reflecting pool is totally, totally stable, completely rectangular. Um, and then let's see, are we missing anything? Is it a balance, rhythm? Oh, yeah, no, we covered dynamic. I think we covered almost everything. Let's see, is there anything I'm missing? I'm, I was thinking that there's one more element I didn't catch. Uh, oh, space, yeah, that's kind of important, I'm sorry. Space for a building is always the most important of the elements. And remember, there's no techniques for space in a building. I sent you guys, if you didn't want to write a piece on architecture, I'm giving you, you know, a, a choice of whatever you want to write about any visual art from any period that interests you that you can find at least three new sources on. 
that's the only prerequisite for the second papers. But I did want to mention that if you do an architecture paper and you get a first draft before the deadline, I can give you a little more helpful input or feedback than uh, I might otherwise, because that's my area of expertise. You know, I've written several books on architecture, uh, but also I sent everyone, I hope you've all at least looked at, if not downloaded, so you have it for future reference from either my class or any other class you might take um, in the future about architecture, how to write about architecture, tips on, on writing about architecture. I hope that's, that's useful to many of you. So space, remember the most important fact about architecture because there will be at least two of the slides, almost certain, yes, at least two of the slides on the slide essay part and several of them on the slide ID part of the final will be architecture. So you will have to write about architecture at some point, certainly at least at the end of the class on, on, on the final. Uh, the two most important things are to remember under meaning for architecture, you always should start with the purpose of the building. Well, we already covered that. This is a, a mosque in, in one of the holiest cities in Persia, and it has many traditional features of a mosque. Uh, and then the other under formal analysis for writing about architecture should be the space. And remember in a building, there's no technique for space. The whole building is space. That's what architecture by definition. The, the American School of Architects, you know, they have a two word definition for all architecture from uh, igloos and teepees and temporary housing of any kind. You know, the tiny houses that you see being built uh, to help homeless people, um, perhaps like my brother who's homeless <laughs> in Dallas. Maybe he'll get one. He's, he's on a waiting list. Um, and all the way up to the grandest mosque or, or cathedral or whatever. All of them have this in common. If they're architecture, they are, quote, enclosed space, two words. That says everything about what architecture. So what is enclosed space here? Very simple. There are prayer rooms with about 15 foot high ceilings, multiple prayer rooms flanking the main entrance. And then there's about a 50 foot high archway, entry arch. And then it opens into one large domed room inside that reaches a height of 60 feet. The dome reaches a height of 60 feet inside. The arch way leading into it is about 50 feet. And these are about 15 feet, each of these prayer room niches. Okay, we covered uh, the first half and we're taking an early break. So uh, why don't we say 7.55 will start and we will be able to end, oh, possibly even before nine. Uh, but we have three more really important slides and then my own slides of uh, Istanbul and some of the fabulous places you can find when you travel to that part of the world will be at the end where you won't need to take notes. And, and then I'll stick around, of course, after that and answer any questions you have. Okay, so let's take about an 18 minute break now. So about 7.35, we'll start again at 7.55, okay? Okay, uh, we had 20 minute break, it's about exactly. So now we can finish up and <clears throat> probably under an hour, I would think, um, perhaps even <clears throat> more like 50 minutes or so, including uh, a few slides at the end of my own <clears throat> slides of uh, Istanbul. We still have three more must-knows that are, um, one in particular, very important to have good notes and study extra carefully, which will be the last slide from the syllabus for tonight, the Taj Mahal. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me just take a drink of water here. But this is also one I'm not going to cut from the study list. I actually, I, I guess I should say, um, mea culpa, I forgot to, and I will now do this for those of you who are taking notes now or watch this on YouTube. The slides that are so important I'm not cutting from the study list are this one, this one, this one, and the last one for tonight. I'll say that when we get to the Taj Mahal. But this is an important slide too. What will not definitely be cut from the study list. Okay, so it's uh, under week 12. It's uh, the third one in order of the way I put it on the syllabus. Okay, the title is Court of the Lions at Alhambra. Court right, of the Lions, plural, at Alhambra. 
and that's spelled A L H A M B R A. Location Spain and the date 1380. Well, the title isn't misleading, but it's incomplete because no one I know of who speaks of this site, or let alone who's been there, as I have, is one of my favorite days of any trip in any country I've been to, calls this site Alhambra. They call it the Alhambra. And that seems, you have to even worry about that in your notes, but it's not a minor distinction. Why? Because it is the palace complex of the sultans of Moorish Spain, the rulers of Moorish Spain, the sultan who ruled that kingdom, it was a kingdom, of what now is, of course, a Christian country, Spain, was ensconced, you could say, or lived, in other words, along with thousands. It was a city within a city is what it was, called the Alhambra. Everyone else calls it that. Um, I think we just shortened it for your, you know, convenience when you, if you write it on the exam. Um, but it's important to know where it is. It's in a city called Granada. You don't have to worry about the spelling, but I'll spell that for you. G-R-E-N-A-D-A. -E Granada, as maybe a few people have knowledge of Southern California, Alhambra is a town in Southern California. And so is Granada, only it's called Granada Hills. I know I lived there for many years, not in either of those towns, but used to drive by them on the freeway with my family. Uh, that is not an accident that the people who named those two towns were thinking of this site. So that gives you a little hint of why it's so important, but it doesn't really explain the main reason it's such an important World Heritage Site. And this is a World Heritage Site on the UN list. So is the Dome of the Rock and the Great Mosque at uh, Cordoba. Why? Because this was the capital, Granada, I'm sorry, the city of Granada, Spain, in southern Spain, was the last, we have to say it correctly, the last uh, capital of Moorish, the kingdom of Moorish Spain. Because they were pushed, how did that happen? Why didn't they just have the same capital the whole time until they left? Because the armies of northern Spain, the small part of Spain that was never conquered by the Muslims, fought to reconquer. They call it the Reconquista, some of you know if you know your Spanish history. And it took them centuries to push the Muslims out of Spain. But when they got to the southern part of Spain, this was all that was left of the Moorish kingdom was the area around Granada. It wasn't very big. It was about you know, the size of a small American state, but it was a kingdom. So this was when that happened, it became the Alhambra was the royal, I'll say it again, compound or complex of the Sultan of the kingdom, the Moorish kingdom of Spain, or the kingdom of Moorish Spain, we should say. And this was in the capital city, uh, their last capital city of the kingdom of Moorish Spain called Granada. But that doesn't tell us a lot. It just gives you some, you know, minimal facts. Why it's considered so important, why it's a UN, UNESCO, they call them World, World sorry, Heritage Site on the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites is because it's unique. There is nothing like it on earth. Why would we say that? Because every single courtyard or open plaza, it has dozens, has a different water feature. No two water features are the same. It was world famous even before it became a tourist site a hundred and some years ago, I'm sure already about 200 years ago, tourists were coming here. But when it was still the capital of Moorish Spain, and this was where the Sultan's complex, his royal complex was, uh, it was known all over, the, at least by educated, you know, people who were interested in world history as one of the most unique architectural sites on earth because every single water feature was different. This is one of them. Of course, it's a fountain with lions. Now, some of you might think already, ah, wait, aren't animals a depiction of living creatures against Islamic religious teaching? Yes, on a mosque but not always on non-mosques buildings. So this is not a mosque. This was one of the many residential halls in that compound 
which is a city. Again, I'll say it again. If you didn't write, you should know. A city within a city. Thousands of people lived here. Thousands of people. Uh, the the sultan himself and his at one point it was over a hundred wives that the sultan of more Spain had. But the point is that that whole extended family of hundreds of people, plus there are many, many, many hundreds, if not thousands of servants, you know, literally waited on them. Then on top of that, there was the, you know, religious, right, figures who ran the mosque. There were several mosques in this. It was literally a city within a city. It's on a very high plateau above the city of Granada. And it is one of the most stunning views that word is so overused by realtors, but it fits here. <laughs> House with stunning view. Yeah, I used to be a realtor, so <laughs> I tried never to use that phrase. It's so cliche. But here, it's not a cliche. You can see, like, almost all the way. You can see all the way to the ocean. Well, the Mediterranean Sea, not literally the Atlantic Ocean from there, because it's, the, uh, it's on the east coast of Spain, southeast corner of Spain. It's near the edge, but not at the coast. You can see for miles and miles from the top of the plateau. That's why the Sultan, the first one to build this palace complex in the 1300s, the last capital city of more Spain, chose that site for that reason. Also, it was easy to defend. They held out for well over 100, almost, a, it was a, like 112 years, you say, over 100 years. This, uh, this, this remained the uh, royal compound of the sultans of the last portion of Moorish Spain, the last part of the kingdom of Moorish Spain. And they held out for over 100 years against the Christian armies that were trying to uh, push them out. Eventually they did, and that was a year. Some of you know you have to write this. 1492, let's see what happened that year. Oh, yes, an event that changed the history of the world. Good, bad, and in between, <laughs> but definitely changed the history of the world was, quote, obviously it wasn't discovery, but the then new knowledge to uneducated Europeans of another continent and that the world was around. Columbus's voyage happened that same year. So, so it's a major site that this managed or major fact of the history and importance of the site that it held out against the uh, conquering Christian armies for well over a hundred years. And they had remember universities and enlightened levels of scholarship and that was true of this last portion of more Spain, uh, not just the early part of when they ruled almost all of Spain. Okay, but the courtyards are just unique. I had this to wrap it up. Why are there so many, about the meaning now, so many different um, water features in each courtyard? And oh, why are they all different? Uh, I'll give you some examples. You don't have to write this. There's reflecting pools. There are fish ponds. There are waterfalls. There are fish ladders. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's just amazing what they achieved. And the water all had to be pumped up this solid rock plateau. The, the engineering alone is, is mind-boggling, how they managed to do that. In a hot, dusty, almost desert-like climate, southern Spain is not much different than North Africa, temperature-wise and, and uh, climate-wise. Why did they do that? Here's the last part of the meeting. Because Islamic culture believes that paradise, right, the, what uh, many Christians would call heaven, paradise, right, the good place you might get to go to after you die, but they just say paradise is a place with plenty of water, it's cool, and there's lots of shade. Well, all three things apply to this entire complex. There is plenty of water, like I was just saying, in each courtyard and inside all these buildings, they had running water. Uh, and then, of course, it's cool because of the, you know, architectural design of it, the shadows and the shading. And it, there's plenty of shade. You can even see that just by looking at this one, one portion of it. Uh, it. It's a good 20 degrees cooler inside these buildings than, than in the exterior of the courtyards. And it gets very hot in Spain in the summer, well over 100 degrees. And many parts of Spain have very few trees, and, and so the, the shade provided inside these buildings is like, you know, part of what they thought paradise would be like. And then the water features complete that symbolism. So it's a symbolic recreation of their image of paradise. And the last fact actually is not a small one you could add about the meaning on this slide is architects for over a hundred years, architects from all over the world have come to this site to study it. Julia Morgan, Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm sh I know Frank Gehry did, <laughs> I read that somewhere. Almost every other great I am Pei, who designed so many incredible buildings all over the world. Um, 
you know, passed away at 103, was it recently? Um, these, these, all these world famous architects from all over, not just the United States, uh, but but many of the most famous Amer most rather most of the most famous American architects for over 100 years from the late 1800s on, they were it's like a pilgrimage. They would come here to sketch it, draw it, paint it, uh, study it because it's so unique. Okay, plenty on the meaning. Formal analysis completely symmetrical. I think you can see that by in this photo. But what you can't see is that there's another portico, right? A column porch behind the photographer facing where the back of the person taking the photo would be. So it's symmetrical in every way. It's symmetrical in, in you know, the placement of the arches and the, and the porticos and in the overall shape. Uh, balanced to me, left to right and top to bottom, if you draw the line roughly here across the, the bottom of these arches, okay? Uh, by the way, it also has the Moorish pointed, I'm sorry, Islamic pointed arches, right? And no, on the buildings in themselves, no living creatures. This is, I forgot to mention this, so I should add this. I'm sorry, one more fact about the meaning. You don't need another one, but this is an easy one to remember if it's on the final. These lions were taken from ruins of a Byzantine uh, site. I'm not sure if it was a temple or a uh, villa, but when the Byzantines conquered Remember, they reconquered two thirds of the old Roman Empire. We covered that last week. One part of this was this area of Spain. They reconquered the whole coastline of Spain and uh, they built temples and they had villas, you know. And so, somewhere, ruins of a Byzantine, old Byzantine abandoned, of course, uh, structure uh, were used. You could say raided if you want to, um, to bring these lions up there. So, so it's doubly okay. First of all, it's not a mosque. So, that rule about, you know, sacrilegious images of living creatures was not considered a sin if it wasn't a boss, but also they weren't even created by Muslim artists, these lions, these funny looking stone lions with no eyes. Um, and then we have, so that's uh, Islamic, that's not Islamic, sorry, but these pointed arches are. And so is the geometric patterns, you see them on the top in the uh, Arabic prayers or Islamic, I keep saying. Islamic prayers in Arabic across the side. So it, it has the feeling of a mosque in a way, but this particular structure was not used for religious purposes. All right, and so we have uh, the rhythm of the pointed arches and the rounded as, or the horseshoe arch. There we have that horseshoe arch we've been talking about. See how it curves in. Both horseshoe arches and pointed arches are used here. They create rhythm. Uh, it's balanced in the total placement of those arches, the columns and the entire shape of it. I would say it's bounced top to bottom and uh, left to right. Uh, and then we have it stable on the walls, the columns, but the arches and the roofs, of course, and the fountains, but this fountain is only one you can see here, uh, are, are of course dynamic. The texture, there is some texture on the lions. I don't know how realistic it is. In fact, it's not. It, these are stylized Byzantine de decorative. <laughs> carvings on the lines, but there's some kind of carved line that creates texture there uh, on the lines. Otherwise, it's the real smooth texture of stone. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a different kind of stone. I think it is. The columns are marble. And up here, I believe it's, it's a lighter stone. Um, and then smooth, so real smooth uh, marble and other stone on the arches and the columns and real smooth texture on the clay tiles. And then you know simulated textures on the lions. The, the the only carved line, well, actually it's quite a bit, I should say. Sorry, carved line is visible all across the top of the arches here and the top of the porticos. Um, so that is carved line, but there's also the visual line formed by the shadows at the corners. Now here the sunlight's kind of filtered, so I think that's why this was probably taken right before sun sunset. Um, a bit when I was up there, it was bright. Day, middle, midday and the shadows were deep, very strong shadows. So that's what would create, of course, natural modeling, only shadows from the sun. There's no technique for modeling. Um, it is um, largest mass would be the portico, no question. Uh, and then I would say the, the arches, unless you count this as a single mass, in which case you could say, I guess, the second largest mass would be the two side rows on either side because they're long. It's a rectangular shaped courtyard. Uh, and the third largest mass would be the uh, the arches and columns on either end flanking the porticos. And the fourth largest would be the, uh, the fountain 
Uh, and then the colors are cool on the fountain and warm on everything else. Well, actually, the, the marble columns are mixed. You see that mixed, warm and cool colors. But all warm colors are used on the stone walls, the arches, the clay tiles. Um, <clears throat> and then let's see, balance. Oh, space, yeah. Uh, inside are multiple rooms, you know, uh, living quarters and, and sitting rooms where they would have had their meals. And the ceilings here, I remember when I went inside this, they're, they're about uh, 20 feet high. Yeah, to the, the peak here, probably 18 feet. So let's just say nearly 20 feet high uh, inside the main rooms. And then the living quarters, the ceilings are lower. So that, then other buildings, you don't have to mention, have other different heights and different you know, arrangements of rooms. But that's, oh yeah, right about is this one structure. Okay, uh, let's see, I think we covered Right, and the modeling already said the shadows, right? All right, this is a must know. Whoops, I went too far with this one. Two different moths, they do look a little alike. Uh, this one is the next must know the Blue Mosque. Blue Mosque from Istanbul. Okay, the location I S T A N B U L. Blue Mosque, Istanbul, 1557. Okay, this was a royal mosque. That's an important detail about the meaning. And how do we know it was a royal mosque besides the historical records of who and why it was built? It was built by and for the Sultan. A royal mosque meant a mosque that was built on the order of the Sultan and was used by him and his family and you know his guests. Not only, I mean, otherwise a mosque would go unused a large part of the time. Mosques are always, every Friday of the year, mosques are busy with prayer. And I can tell you from experience, and you're gonna see in my slides, even during hurricanes. Yeah, I was in Istanbul during a hurricane. That was a strange experience. And I lived through it partly because the mosque was open. This mosque was where me and my then girlfriend ran to get out of the hurricane welcoming us with open arms they really did so this mosque was built for a sultan a turkish sultan of the turkish empire and that's one of the least known parts of of the history of you know the old world i guess you could call it the eastern hemisphere the turkish empire was huge it was almost as big as the roman empire and it lasted not quite as long but nearly you know roman empire lasted close to 600 years right uh, and the Turkish Empire for over 450 or something, so over four centuries, the Turkish Empire was huge. So once it had, the Turkish Empire expanded to conquer almost all of the old Byzantine Empire, including the southern parts of Europe. Well, we should say southeastern part, they didn't conquer Italy, but they conquered the Balkans, you know, Greece, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, all those countries. You don't have to write that. You can just say they conquered a chunk of southern, or you be more specific, southern, southeastern Europe and ruled for centuries, that part of Europe. This was their headquarters. It was their capital city, Istanbul, and the sultan who, one of, not the, but one of the sultans who helped expand the Turkish empire into Europe was the one who built this mosque. But the way we know without even having to check facts or research that it is a royal mosque is royal mosque had at least four minarets. Well, this has four minarets. And yet when you look at it, you think you see five, right? Well, this is actually a minaret that belongs to another mosque, which is the Hagia Sophia that was converted to mosque. You're gonna see that in my own slides, it'll be more clear. So just say four minarets mark a building, a mosque specifically as a royal mosque built by and for the use of, but not exclusively of a Sultan. Okay, the Sultan who had this built was Suleiman the Magnificent. Don't ask me to spell it, but if you wanna know the Octomom, some of you know what I'm talking about, the woman that had eight kids, the, the most live verse of any American, uh, woman, last I checked, the Octo mom. Anyway, she used to be in the news. She was recently again. I think her kids are graduating from middle school or something. They're you know Octo twins or whatever the phrase is. Um, she is descended. She claims from this guy, from the from the Sultan who built this mosque and ruled over the golden age of the expansion of the Turkish Empire. Suleiman, I will spell it for you, but I wish I had a board to write it on. But it's S U L. 
E-Y-M-A-N. I've heard it spelled with an I-Y. You know, words, foreign words can be spelled multiple ways. So if you want to write it uh, just the phonetic way, S-U-L-E-Y-M-A-N. Suleiman was a, a very powerful sultan of the Turkish Empire who ruled during their golden age and conquered many parts of Southern Europe. And he built many mosques. This is just one of them. Most beautiful though, of all of his mosques. And he hired the best architect in the Turkish empire. And I should put his name on the syllabus, but we already have just the location. So this is part of the meaning now. Sinan, his name was his last name. The greatest architect in the Turkish empire designed this and many other mosques for that Sultan. Sinan, S-I-N-A. And he was so famous, he just went by his last name. Uh, he was known not just in the Arabic, I'm sorry, sorry, Muslim world, but actually he did go to Arabic parts of the Muslim world, but he was also known in Europe too as a great architect. It, it, this is one of the most beautiful buildings I've been in. Once you go inside, you'll see my slides of the interior of it, what it looked like during a hurricane. So blue stone is the last part of the meeting now. Why is it called the Blue Mosque? Because the stone that you can see, not the domes, that's a modern, right? Those are modern metal coverings that may or may not be original, but, the, but the, it's been replaced, of course, multiple times since metal rust. I mean, it's over 500 years old or right? thereabouts. So what you see uh, of the walls, it's the stone itself. It's called blue stone, and it's brought from mountains in Turkey, hundreds of miles away. You could just say it that way, from hundreds of miles away, stone in mountains in you know, the mainland of Turkey, however you want to call it, the right word is Asia Minor, right? Um, this is the corner of Turkey that, that overlaps with Europe. It's the only city on earth that does that, that's in two continents. There is no other city in the world that is bridges or spans two different continents, only Istanbul. One of the other amazing things of many unique features of that city. You'll see the evidence of that in, in my slides in a little bit. Okay, so these stones were brought from hundreds of miles away from the, you get to see the interior of Turkey and it's called blue stone and it's very rare and very precious. And that's why the Sultan chose to build it with that kind of material and have his architect design it that way. Okay, and then we have the domes um, here, they're on pendentives. So they were of course inspired by the Byzantines. Remember the Greek Orthodox church architecture. Well, that's because they had Greek Orthodox churches they had conquered and taken over and made into mosques. So they had that right there in front of them. Most mosque domes are not that, they are on drums. The, the simpler earlier version the Romans invented of how to make a dome building. But the uh, ones in Turkey, or at least this part of Tur the Turkish empire, certainly in Turkey itself, are usually domes on pendentives resting on the corners, but the shape of the buildings are not the shape of a Christian cross or a Greek cross, of course. Okay, so you'd have to just know that it's a, um, a royal mosque with only four original minarets. This minaret, same style, probably designed by the same architect, probably Sinan, was placed next to the uh, Hagia Sophia, which is right next door to this building. So the last fact now about the meaning is that this mosque has a dome that's about two thirds, well, just is, you can say two thirds the size of the Hagia Sophia dome next door. Why? Why didn't they just go all out and make it bigger? They could have. They had the skill, the talent, the technology, the, the, the money. I mean, they were a powerful, wealthy empire. Well, it's just that this Sultan decided to be more modest in making his own royal mosque not compete with the size and beauty of Hagia Sophia. In other words, they were tipping, you know, their turbans, their hats, whatever you want to say, their cultural nod. They were giving a, a respectful nod, is how I'd put it symbolically, of course, to an earlier culture, which at that time, Christians were still allowed to worship inside the Hagia Sophia. Remember, we covered that last week with the last slide from not now, they're not. Under the current Turkish government, they've gone backwards. <laughs> they've made it into a mosque and they're closing it off to everybody except Muslims, which is not really appropriate because it's a world heritage site and it ought to be open to people from all over the world, which it was until about a year ago. But this mosque is, as a functioning mosque, open to non-Muslims. I can tell you because I was in there more than once in my week or so in Istanbul. So it's a still functioning mosque to this day. But the last fact, again, I'll recap that that's not a minor point is that the dome was deliberately kept smaller, specifically two thirds the width and height. Well, actually it's nowhere near the width, the height, it's 120 feet high. 
So about two thirds the height of the uh, dome next door to it as a deliberate gesture of respect by that Sultan to the earlier building next door, which had been converted into a mosque. Okay, let's do a formal analysis, completely symmetrical. That no matter where you draw the line, left to right, all mosques is symmetrical, I mentioned. And, and it would have been just these four minarets. See, these are the minarets at the corner. I think if you look closely, you can see this is farther away. It's not part of this building. This is from a different building. Just looks like it has five minarets, but it's only four. Okay, and, and then we have the rhythm of the minarets and the windows and the domes or the main dome. And then these are half domes on apses. Remember the word apse, so this has multiple apses. Those are all curved as are the domes. So they're dynamic. The windows, the arch windows are dynamic. The minarets are both. They're tall, upright, straight. Therefore, they're, they're, they're overall structurally, they are stable, but of course they're round. So that makes them both stable and dynamic. The texture is the real rough texture of stone and the real smooth texture of glass and metal on the domes. Color is cool. Everything here is cool. Oh, off white on the stone on the walls and blue on the um, domes, the metal covering the domes. And uh, well, this looks warm. That's true. There is a little bit of gold on it, just at the very peak of some of these domes. There is some gold. So that's a little touch of warm color. For space, I've mentioned already, but I'll repeat it. It's one large open domed building with a dome that reaches about 120 feet from the floor to the top of the dome. There are other rooms, but the main room, all you have to describe is the main space, the, the prayer room. And you'll see that when I show you my own slides, is, uh, is, is one big open room with uh, multiple actually, right, curved, right, it, um, apses. You can see those from inside, of course. But the main space is in the center where the dome reaches a height of 120 feet. Let's see, uh, shadows create the natural modeling. There's no technique for modeling. There's no carved or drawn or painted line on this building. None that I could see, none in this photo. So it's only uh, the visual line around the edges of the windows that we can see here. Then the largest mass is the dome, no question. If you count it as one mass, the dome and the drum, that would be even bigger. But you could say first the, 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 the central dome, and then it's a close call, maybe the minarets, because they're pretty, pretty tall. They actually reach hi higher, of course, than the top of the dome. And then I guess third largest would be probably the drum. Well, it's not a drum, really. It's the base of the dome because it rests on pendentum. So you count this as one mass. So that is the largest mass, the dome and the base of it. Sorry. <laughs> then the minarets and then the largest apses. Okay, I think we can. You, uh, can you repeat that last one? Sure, 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 sure. Slower. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, in order, the largest masses are the drum with its base because that I said drum. I meant dome. This is all one mass. Is my let's go up close and you'll see what I mean. See, it's not, it's not really supported by this. This is all one structure here. It would be different if it was like the Dome of the Rock, the first slide we saw tonight, or any Roman dome building. There'd be a separate structure that then the dome rests on. This is all one structure here. And it's it's all considered a single mass. Therefore, it's the largest mass is the uh, dome including the base. Then the minarets would be the second largest. Remember, this is not part of this complex. These four are. So each of those minarets would be the, uh, of course, equal mass would be the second largest masses. And then the third largest mass would be the largest apses. You see these? Because that actually goes all the way to the, right, to the foundation. So that would be the third largest. There's a series of four of them. See, there's two, and you can see two more on the the ocean side. Well, I keep saying ocean. Mediterranean is so big, it feels like an ocean, but it's actually a sea. Okay, I think we've covered everything on that. But now we get to a really important slide. I'm going to skip this one. I was going to include it. It's another do uh, domed mosque uh, by the same architect in central Turkey, but I took it out of the syllabus, so you don't have to write about it. But just so you can see how skilled he was. This is, a, you know, in some uh, medium-sized city in the interior of Turkey by Sinan, the same architect. So there her, maybe he, he lived long enough. He worked under several sultans. So I don't know if it was the same sultan that had this built, but it's, it's close enough in age. It's like 1560 or so. So it probably was the same sultan ordered it built, but it's also a royal mosque. So then it would have been because he was, you know, sultan 
ordered to uh, be built for his use whenever he visited this part of Turkey. Um, but it's, it's quite fascinating. I, I didn't get to this part of Turkey. I just went to the coastline. Uh, but you can see it's very similar in many ways, except it doesn't use that same blue stone. This is more traditional off-white and gray, you know, types of, of rustic stone that's called sandstone. It's much rougher than uh, blue stone or marble would be, <clears throat> but it has the same concept of four minarets. Okay, but we're going to end with this. It's very important. This slide is way up there on the list of probable slides for the final uh, the either the essay part or it wouldn't be both, but either the essay slide essay analysis questions or the slide ID questions. Taj Mahal, as I think most of you know uh, those two words, but I'll spell them. T A J and then second word M A H A L. The location is Agra, India, and that's the city in India where it was built. A G R A, India. That is not my, if you just put India, you won't get credit for that part of your answer. And after all, every point counts. So you never know, it could, could make the difference between an A and a B or whatever, uh, you know, the next grade in, in, in your final total points. Why is that important? Hey, isn't there just this building? And that they, No, there's other Taj Mahals, other buildings with names that are either the same or very similar in other cities in India. And uh, so we want to be specific. This is the most famous, obviously of all of probably the most famous site in India, period, and some would say in the world. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, Agra, so it's part of the, the identifying location. A-G-R-A, India, the date 1648. Now, this is a three, or you could say triple if you want to, that'd be all right, purpose building or site. First, it's a functioning mosque. It always has been and still is. It has Friday prayers, you know, every week there are the regular Muslim prayers, plus you can go in and pray any other time of the uh, week. So it's a functioning mosque, is built as that, and it's a royal mosque. Here you can see the four minarets, right? Okay, the second thing is that it's a mausoleum. To whom? Inside there is a sarcophagus, is all part of the meaning, right? A sarcophagus containing the remains of the deceased queen, the wife of the Shah who built it. All right, now I used to, actually I know her name, but it's very hard to spell, even harder to pronounce correctly. So I'll just say the wife of Shah Jahan. Now his name you should have in your notes, Jahan. His name is all over the British Isles in every town that has Indian restaurants and more than one, there's a Shah Jahan Indian restaurant. <laughs> It's just, well, because of the ruling of the British Empire over India, they were very, very fascinated with this history. So Shah, S-H-A-H, right, his title, you know, like Sultan. Jehan, his last name is J-E-H-A-N, was the ruler of Mughal India. And um, let's see, we covered who the Mughals were, remember? They were the Islamic culture that invaded and ruled over most of India for three centuries. The Mughals, they were the ruling class. They didn't force people to convert to Islam, but many millions did. There's what is it, 180 million Muslims in India now out of 1.4 billion people. It's a lot. Okay, so what we have is a uh, artifact or, or you know, remnant. There's a better word, remnant of the Mughal period of the culture of India when it was ruled by Muslims. Even though most of the people never converted, and as you know, are almost it's like not 85 to 90 percent uh, uh, Hindu. Uh, nonetheless, this is a holy site to not just Muslims because it's so special. The third purpose of this building is probably what makes it so famous, besides the beauty of it, so both really equally. The design makes it so attractive, and we'll say why in a few minutes. But the third purpose may be the most compelling fact about the meaning. Why did he build it, and why did he put her... Um, sarcophagus inside here because she was the love of his life. She died at 32 years old, giving birth to their 14th child. They were childhood sweethearts. It was an arranged marriage. Almost all of the upper class marriages were then, and they often are even now, but back then, definitely, especially among ruling classes. 
So even though it was an arranged marriage, they really did love each other. And he never got over her death. So he built this, another way to say it in a single sentence, is that Shah Jahan built this as a monument to his undying love to his deceased wife. He never remarried. He lived for quite a while after this. He could have remarried any eligible you know, woman of legal age in the whole kingdom. You know, huge, you know, India and, and Pakistan combined right into one kingdom. He could have had his choice, but he chose not to ever remarry because he never got over his grief. So this is a monument to his undying love to his deceased wife. It's a very strong, powerful, romantic message that the building symbolizes. <clears throat> okay, and then we have the fact that it's got these features that mark it as distinctively Muslim and a couple that are more specific than that. Let's start with the pointed arches. Well, we already know those are Islamic. Then the fact that it's a mosque, there are no, these are all facts about the meaning. If it's on the exam, you've already written them, but you might want to write them again, just so you have them in those notes. If it's sitting in front of you during open book, of course, test will be open book and open note. Uh, because that's part of the meaning of this and any other mosque slide that might come up on the final. There are no living creatures here, but there are these geometric patterns here. And then here there are plants motifs, which is acceptable because it's not considered living creatures like animals and humans. And then finally, there, is, there are Arabic uh, prayers. Uh, I should say Islamic prayers in Arabic, I gotta say the right. And, and uh, so actually those are here, that's what this is. And then I may have, wait a minute, I may have another view of it. No, I don't, yeah, that's an, another file. But you can see that there's uh, carved lines here which create uh, Arabic writing and Islamic prayers in Arabic. These are the geometric patterns here as well as around the archways. So those three facts, make this a traditional mosque in that the pointed arches, the uh, geometric decorative patterns with no living creatures and the Islamic prayers in Arabic, even though they don't speak Arabic here, obviously this is India, um, <clears throat> always are found on mosque. Minarets on almost all mosques. And of course those are traditional uh, mosque features, right? But what isn't traditional is the onion domes. They borrowed those in another example of cultural appropriation, you could call it historical appropriation, from Russia. Onion domes go back over a thousand years. I, I've been all over Russia, uh, even long before I knew I'd be adopting a daughter from there. And uh, I went with Russian uh, guides, historians, you know, writers, very interesting people. And they were proud of, they rightfully so, that they invented the whole concept of golden domes, using gold on domes, first used in Russia, and onion-shaped domes are Russian inventions. They're on churches as old as 1,200 years old, from the 800s, there's still some left in Russia, very early Christian churches. Uh, they had converted to Christianity, you know, sometime in the early Middle Ages. So look at a map, India and Russia, well, the Russian empire back then was bordered against the Northern Himalayas. So they're right across the mountains from each other. So the bottom line is that the only thing that's not traditionally Muslim, or indigenous to Muslim culture would be the onion domes. Those were borrowed from Russia um, and used on many other mosques, of course, besides this. Okay, and then finally, the most specific thing of all, and it's even not Persian anymore, but it started, remember, in Persia because Persian architects invented the reflecting pool. One last fact, what other place in this country, well, I already said the city, Washington, DC. So what uh, historic uh, site in Washington can you think of anybody where reflecting pool is a very prominent part of the design? Anybody? Nobody can think of a place with a reflecting pool in Washington, DC. I know it's getting late. <laughs> the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> The Lincoln Memorial is patterned after their reflecting pool, I'm sorry, at the Lincoln Memorial, not the structure, is patterned. Now, in fact, that architect went to India and sketched these details, the pool, the grounds, and even the building behind it, and drew up his plans after visiting India, after this site. So it's considered, the last fact about the meaning, to be one of the most, if not the most beautiful sites on earth by every poll that's ever been taken. I mean, the UN, World Cultural Organizations, 
uh, you know, general international pollsters, whatever, all around the world, not just people from the India tourism industry or whatever it's called. Uh, there's no disputing that. It's one of the most famous buildings. People recognize it at a glance and it is considered one of the, it's always in the top five. That, I know that because I just looked that up and using at or near the top of the list of the world's most beautiful sites. Um, uh, you know, man-made or, well, there would have been man working on it. There's no question at that time it would have been quote, man-made unquote, or human-made, however you want to write that. The point is that th there aren't many other places that are considered equally beautiful or as beautiful as this. Okay, let's do the formal analysis and then I'll show you just a few minutes of my own slides. And we'll end right about uh, nine-ish, as I said, or maybe a tad before. All right, so we have the rhythm of the onion domes, the pointed arches, the geometric carvings and prayers and the minarets. Uh, the domes uh, and the pointed arches are dynamic. The walls are stable and I'd call the minarets mostly stable, but of course they are both because of their round outside shape but the reflecting pool is totally stable. Okay, then we have the color cool white, that's all there is here. And it's the real texture of smooth marble and smooth glass uh, on the uh, facade. You can't really see any other textures from here. Um, there's a little bit of metal, yeah, you could say on the finials. I think I mentioned that word, that'll come up on the final. Well, not as a definition or true false question, but these pointed decorations on any kind of architecture are called finials. All kinds of cultures use finials. So those are metal. So I guess you could say it's three textures. Small amount of smooth metal, lots of smooth marble, and smooth glass. You can't really see the simulated textures here, but there is carved line, of course. It's carved. Here it's not tile work, unlike other mosques we've been seeing. Uh, so this is all done with a uh, carved line on the geometric patterns and the Arabic prayers. And shadows here are part of the concept. Here it is a part of the design. It's a feature of the design. Those deep recessed niches, there's no other way to say it, deeply recessed niches behind the pointed arches are always in shadow. And that's part of what makes this building so dramatic and so attractive and so beautiful, as well as the white marble. It's the finest marble they could find in, uh, I assume it's the Himalayas, but the mountains of India that was brought here from hundreds of miles away to, to build it. Uh, and then we have, um, we already mentioned the rhythm, I think, yeah, car, let's say, oh, balance. It's balanced left to right, obviously, even with the minarets, uh, but unbalanced toward the bottom. Um, and so the line is both carved and visual. Let's see, oh, the largest mass. Well, if you count the reflecting pool, that would be, but I wouldn't say it's part of the structure. So the base is the largest mass, then the main walls, and then the central dome. You can see there are other domes on, on either side, but the central dome is obviously the largest. And then for space, the, the uh, base is about 30 feet high and the interior goes about 120 feet to the top of the dome and then another 30 foot finial. So what you've got is, well, 30 and 120, right? We would make it about 150 feet to the top of the finial. So just say the total height is about 150 feet of which the base is about the first 30 and then the, the building itself is about 120 feet to the peak of the, the dome. All right, I think we've covered all the elements. So now I'm gonna just take le less than 90 seconds. It's pretty quick if I can just pull this up and we'll see a few slides of Istanbul, the city where two continents meet and uh, three cultures overlap. Okay, and that's right here. Okay, so to get to Istanbul, we go to the bottom of this list. There we go. Now I have to do the share, of course, so we'll do that right now. Back to screen share, here we go. Now this should be visible. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Yeah, good, thank you. You don't have to take notes now. This is on the outskirts of uh, Istanbul. It's one of the first mosques the Turks built after they conquered the Byzantine Empire. Well, all that was left of the Byzantine Empire by the time they conquered the city was that city, the walled city of Constantinople. So it's over 500 or six, almost 600 years old. Uh, but it has the same features we've been seeing. You know, there's 
there's a, uh, in this case, it's a dome on a drum, pointed arch, you have to write any of this course, and then there's no living creatures on it, you see, and it's not a royal mosque, it's just got two minarets. But here is another mosque further along in getting closer to the center of the city. And I think you can see if you get up close there, here we are in a Turkish has, it's their own language, right? The Turks speak their own language, thousands of years old, right? Turkic, it's called. Um, and they don't speak Arabic, but it's a rule that all mosques have to have uh, prayers, Islamic prayers uh, carved on the outside of their mosque in Arabic, the language of Muhammad. Okay, you see that here even more so. Actually, these look like hieroglyphics, don't they? Yeah, that's right. I forgot about this one. I haven't seen this slide in a while. Uh, I'm not sure of the meaning of that, but I assume it has. Is it is yet a third mosque? We're getting into the center of town. Now, this is the Hagia Sophia. So let's walk around it and go inside it. It's been converted to a mosque, as I mentioned last week when we saw the slides of the interior that might be on the final. And so these uh, minarets were added. But for some reason, six minarets were added to this mosque. You see, it's not a royal mosque. It wasn't built by or for any sultan. It was built by, but not for, Justinian, emperor of the Byzantine Empire. So I don't know if that's the reason why they went ahead and broke their own rule of never having more than four minarets. It had six minarets. And you see, this is what's left of their Colosseum, just the ruins. And now they've re-erected, I think, a part one of my students went there a few years ago and you, you could see a section of a wall raised back, but nowhere near, you know, not even a whole world of seats or anything. That's the ruins of what was there. Because um, uh, you know, because when the Turks took over, you, no way you were allowed to do that, have family friendly or any other kind of live entertainment. It was against the strict interpretation of Islam that they practiced, as you may know from current events and things. It depends on which Muslim country or Muslim majority country you're in, whether they allow live entertainment or not. It varies. But here is the Hagia Sophia with its one, two, three, four, five, six. You see, that's six minarets. No other mosque I know of has that many. And there's the blue mosque. Now you can see, see, that's the corner of the Hagia Sophia's walls. And here is this is the way this place looks. It was beginning to get stormy. It was the day before a category two hurricane. Now, anybody here been to a hurricane? It's not like a category four or five, but it's not something to mess with. You don't want to be out on the open streets when a category two hurricane hits, which was coming. So we had to go see, do our sightseeing, me and my girlfriend at the time, fairly quickly from each site to the next. Not dreaming we'd be caught almost in the open storm the next day. There it is again. You see why it's called the Blue Mosque. And the stormy sky starting to gather overhead the clouds. Um, it's 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 hard to explain. When you go inside, you'll see the inside. That'll be the last one. Now back to the Hagia Sophia because they're next to each other. I've had some students say this looks like the helmet or headgear of a Turkish warrior from the 1500s when they were at their golden age and their empire was at its height and they conquered, like I said, a good chunk of Europe and all of the Middle East. They had one of the largest empires in the world. Uh, their soldiers were fierce. They were greatly respected and feared all over the Western world. So, and then maybe these, some one of my students was writing a paper saying it almost evokes the image of, you know, spears or, or swords being raised in a row of soldiers marching into battle. Okay, so let's go inside. Here we go, inside the Hagia Sophia. Now, I was lying on my back to take this, but this is one of the uh, added decorations by Muslims when it was converted into a mosque after the first conquest by the Turks. But most of what we can see, oh yeah, it went out the back end. Now, I wanted to capture this. See what these are? If you ever traveled in the Central Valley, let alone the Midwest of the US, you know, where I grew up, you see these giant grain elevators that rise up to two or 300 feet. Well, here they are, almost 200 feet. Remember the top of that dome is 182 feet. And they do help support the dome. They're buttressing, but it's it's mostly the side walls, the corners, remember that occult pandemics. So let's go inside here. And I think you can see that this is the original Byzantine 1500 year old uh, frescoes and uh, mosaics, more so mosaics, because remember I said last week, and you should have that in your notes from the last slide or last two slides, 
of mosaics from the Byzantines. They were the greatest mosaic artists in the ancient world. You'll see the evidence of that as we go along. Now that's just a hint of how big the dome is. You're gonna see a much better view. It's hard to focus and there's no natural light. You cannot use a tripod or a flash inside this building. Well, now you can't do any photography because it's a functioning mosque. But back when it was a uh, World Heritage Museum and you were allowed to take pictures, it was very difficult to get good solid uh, photos, but I was able to get several. So here are some of the Byzantine patterns of decoration here on the arches. These are actually, of, the dome is supported by these right curved lines. You saw them at a distance in that last slide from last week of the Hagia Sophia that helped support the weight. And then this looked like a modern train station waiting room or something, or, or you know, central, right, uh, platform room where you catch the trains, I should say waiting room. It was so modern looking, I thought it was a, an alteration of the wall of one of those apses. No, this is 1500 year old metal framed windows. Now the glass has probably been replaced, but even some of those panes of glass could be that old. Pretty impressive, there you go. Now it doesn't affect, right? If I turn this out, I already know the answer, right? It doesn't affect the lighting on the screen where you guys are looking. I have backlighting here that makes it hard for me to see the details of my own slide. There are the Arabic prayers again added. Someone had to climb up on scaffolding 182 feet above the floor. But look at that dome. That dome has survived the largest dome ever built in the ancient world for 15 centuries, like I was saying last week, through floods and hurricanes and uh, all kinds of, you know, abuse by crusaders and, and pollution and, uh, you know, every, every kind of, uh, neglect for centuries. And then it was restored as a museum. I think it was in the 1800s when it was reopened as, or early 1900s as a museum. These are those columns that reach 20 feet, uh, I'm sorry, or 20 feet at the top and 40 feet tall at the bottom. Those are Roman ruins, columns from Rome. But here are the fresco, or sorry, mosaics I meant. You can see here how well done these are. There's Mary, mother of Jesus, Jesus himself. Of course, they all have halos, these are icons. This is what's left that wasn't scraped off the wall by the Turkish soldiers. One of their sultans came along and I think I said this was part of the meaning of the slide last week of there, Sophia, but you don't have to write this now, that it was pretty enlightened for, the, for one of the later sultans, not the first one who conquered this city, but not long after when he heard the soldiers, his own soldiers were scraping, you know, one at a time, one, you know, fresco or one mosaic at a time, all these uh, religious images of the Christian church that, you know, occupied the building off the walls. He said, stop, stop. We shouldn't do that. We should respect that, you know, past history. And that's a pretty impressive enlightened attitude. So here are some that have been restored. There's Justinian and his wife, Theodora. The two of them hired the architects. I think she supervised the construction of the building. She was very highly educated. And they were one of those couples who were childhood sweethearts and really in love uh, in genuine terms. And there's your Greek cross on the Bible that Jesus is holding. And that's real gold, what looks like gold is. Here are those columns again that are 40 feet high and dwarfed by the building they're a part of. And Halloween, we just missed it by one day. This is a spider web. I don't know what the heck that's doing there, but that's on one of the uh, pendentants or, or corners. And then here are symbols that some people have said they think they look like the Pope's crown when the Pope wears one of his high, tall hats. Can't be, this is not a Catholic site of course of uh, those are frescoes of course on the arches and then you see these incredible mosaics you can't get higher than the top row of columns now but uh, somehow somebody got up there to restore these over the last several decades um, now these might not have been uh, damaged before that sultan ordered the uh, scraping <laughs> to be stopped um, again, previous um, emperors of the, of the Byzantine Empire. And here's the Archangel Michael, the largest of all the figures on the walls of the church. And that was one where they were about to keep scraping the rest of it off when the Sultan actually saw that, according to what I've read, went into the building, was told what was going on, saw it and said immediately stop. And here are your Arabic, uh, you know, Islamic prayers in Arabic, and those giant shields, prayer shields. Here's the, the building again from the outside. Now we're going to go walk just for another about a dozen more slides just to the Blue Mosque before the hurricane hit. 
Uh, there's the buttresses on the back end of this massive building. And then I think you can tell something's coming. <laughs> two point, two, two, two category, not 2.0, category. It's, uh, the, my, the winds were 100 miles, 105 miles an hour. It's not something you're going to be able to stand up in. So there was warning by loudspeakers on the streets of the city. Now, this is thir no more than 30 years ago. And they were telling everyone in English, Turkish, and I believe French and German, the main languages they figured tourists would speak, get off the streets in a, two hours or something. There will be a hurricane. It will not be safe. This is a Roman aqueduct, which had been left uh, by, Con or built, I'm sorry, I meant built. Well, it was left too. By Constantine, the emperor who founded the city, and he made sure it had all the infrastructure it needed. They didn't have to worry about Congress blocking it, sorry. <laughs> he wanted it done, it was done. So all of the infrastructure for a city of several hundred thousand, the whole city uh, today is done both over 12 million metropolitan, they're about the size of greater Chicago. But back then, even when Constantine died and he had only started the city, what, 20 some years before he died, maybe 30 years before he uh, passed away, it had already grown into a city of over, oh, well over a quarter of a million, probably you know, more like a third of a million and eventually became about half a million, which was a large city. Even now that's not a small town in the middle ages when it was the capital of the Byzantine empire. And you can see people still have doggy carts there. <laughs> and of course they're coming from the countryside to sell produce. They better hurry. They've got less than eight hours or to think it's six hours before the hurricane hit. And the old neighborhoods of, uh, of um, Istanbul. Now this is the part where the Turks when they took over, started building their own housing. It's beautiful. Um, the cemeteries, you, you could tell these Turkish symbols here for uh, soldiers who died in battles fighting for the Turkish empire. Uh, and then these are the uh, old wooden houses there on the UNESCO World Heritage List. They are 500 years old, some of them closer to 600 because the Turks took over in the 1400s. So some of them go back that far. But many of them are falling apart like this one, but somehow still inhabitable but they've been restored. Now here's in a distance here. I was going to say that's a blue moss, but I realize it can't be. It only has two minarets on this little boy wanted to know where, if I knew his uncle Ahmed who lived in Chicago. I remember him saying that name. I said, you know, I'm from Chicago, but I don't live there. There's 10 million people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know your, your uncle. I wish I could say how he's doing for you. Okay. So let's wrap it up with the trip to, here we go. The last uh, site we're going to look at is the blue mosque as it was getting close to, oh, and you can see from the grounds, the walls that Constantine built to protect the city, they withstood assaults for, let me do them over 11 centuries. It was first, it was um, what other empires that tried to attack from the North and South, then it was the Turks for hundreds of years. They kept trying to take over the city and they, they weren't able to break through the walls until the mid 1400s. And this is the grounds of Topkapi, the most famous museum of Islamic art in the world, the largest, I believe, in the heart of Istanbul. Um, they were closing early because of the hurricane. In fact, I think this woman had been on, in the front uh, entryway and taking people's tickets. It has some of the most beautiful collections. Oh, it has the biggest emeralds in the world are here inside. They were for the Sultan on display. There's a movie, extra credit, if you want to watch it, called Topkapi, named after this. And it's hilarious. And it's a true story of the time that a bunch of international thieves, a team of them tried to rob that crown or actually just the emerald from that crown and what happened to them when they did break into the, the museum, but uh, they didn't succeed in getting away with. So here we are, we're gonna wrap it up with about half a dozen images of the inside of this mosque, which I can tell you the experience was more than memorable, not just because it was on the day when a hurricane was forcing people inside the nearest safe building, but because of the way we were treated, me and my girlfriend, clearly not Muslim, almost certainly they knew we were American tourists. And certainly once we started talking, they could tell. The son of the Imam came over, he was around 12, offered us coffee, uh, Turkish candy, prayer rugs to kneel on. I went ahead and joined the prayers because it was noontime prayer when the hurricane hit. And it was a beautiful ceremony. It lasted, uh, I think, about an hour. The hurricane blew over in about three hours. So we were in there for over two hours until the winds had died down. And look at the stained glass. You don't get stained glass in most mosques. But this one, they spared no expenses. And then there's that dome that reaches up to another stained glass window there. That is the dome that's two thirds of the size or the height of the one at Ayasofya next door by choice of the Sultan. 
And then we'll end up with yeah, a few details, but then looking through, there's one of the apses that you could see from the slide of the outside that was on the must know list before the break. Here's the hurricane coming in off the Mediterranean. It's very rare for hurricane to, to sometimes hurricanes hit the uh, Western Mediterranean, you know, off the coast of Spain, of course, and in, even into Italy, maybe. But to get this far into the, you know, edge or the far end, actually, of the Mediterranean Sea is very rare. So it was like a once in a generation thing happened to happen while we were there. But we were safe and sound inside this mosque. And then we'll wrap it up with the last two or three views are of the two continents facing each other across a footbridge and of course the waterway that people travel a ferry this ferry boat that goes back and forth and all these fishermen with these wonderfully colorful boats that they've been fishing from generations of that same family probably 200 years some of these boats are that age and the turk i, I like the turkish flag this is asia and the other side that we spent most of the time in the oldest part where the Hagia Sophia is and the Blue Moss, that's called, that's Europe. But the other half of Istanbul is on the other side of the Straits of the Bosporus, it's called, and that's Asia, the, the actual continent of Asia. Just, you know, a short distance across the water and in the same city limits. So we'll end up with the last, I think it's the last view I have here. Yeah, there we go. You can take that footbridge there we go, I had two more views. And just walk between two continents. Uh, just jumping around. And uh, those two continents side by side, there it is, there's the um, Blue Mosque, right? And then the ISFE would be behind it, you can't quite see it. But I'll, I'll finish with this. Um, there is none of city in the world that you could walk across on foot in about 10 minutes from one continent to another within the same city limits. And Istanbul is unique in that and many other ways. Okay, I'm going to stop now and take any questions anybody might have, if you do, okay, about anything we've covered, any of the slides we saw tonight. Remember, your papers are due three weeks from tonight, so you have some time, but uh, I still haven't gotten papers from some people, and if you join late, you might have missed my uh, making the, the point that if you didn't get a grade yet from your first paper, that means I haven't seen it. So, without my having to mention names that's you know not really kosher to do that or appropriate uh, you know for privacy's sake i won't you know i did that at the beginning of the semester because there were so many people that might have needed a little bit of information to give them the incentive to as many did uh, go ahead and turn in their paper a little late but whether it was turned in and i didn't get it or you just haven't done it whatever the reason is if you didn't get a grade it's because i haven't seen your paper your first paper i'm talking about so if that's the case with anyone here tonight you need to go resend it to me and make sure it's sent properly under the exact name the spelling of your first and last name as you registered exactly the same otherwise it might go astray and of course it needs to go to mark w at aol as a pdf and I already said this, but I'll go ahead and do it one more time in case you join late in this format. Sorry, whoops. <laughs> Our 2.1 short paper, it'll be number one if it's if you're making up for a late paper, right? Sorry. Uh, and then last name, comma, first name, exactly the way you enrolled in the class. Whatever other forms of your name you use, a middle name or hyphenated last name, if you didn't enroll under that name, I, I might not get the paper. It might go astray or get spammed out again you don't want that so make sure you you follow that uh procedure for labeling it and then of course it goes to mark w at aol uh, it's much easier for me to retrieve and download and, and keep copies of it that way and then i will grade it personally not wait and send it to a reader and get it back to you within 48 hours if you haven't already gotten a grade for your first paper then you need to do that either resend it with some proof of when you sent the original or finished writing it and send it as soon as you can. Okay, any questions now? Cause you have time now, but you should probably by next class week, what one week from tonight will be uh, two weeks from the due date. You should have picked a topic and begin researching if not writing your paper, your second paper. Okay, any questions about extra credit? Have you, um, have you graded the tests yet? Almost finished. I've graded my portion of them, but I believe in giving back the grades almost all in the same time frame. Okay, uh, so we shouldn't have received the email yet. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, go ahead. You know what? Just as a courtesy, I mean, that's what I'm here for. And that's what this portion of each evening's lecture or each evening's class is for is, you know, we call it cleanup, housekeeping, <laughs> you know, 
clearing the decks, whatever. So give me your last name and I'll verify the slide is probably, I'm slide, the test, the, the PDF is probably with uh, one of my readers. Hang on. <laughs> so it's over here. I've got files. This is my partially working space in my bedroom. Most of my files, of course, online out in my studio. And I'm not in my studio. I'm at home in my bed bedroom here. So would you tell me your, your full last name? So I can. Yeah, Rabin, R A B I N. Let's see. Okay, and we're talking about art uh, 2.1. You're talking about the actual midterm. Midterm. Yeah, see, that doesn't ring a bell. So it might have gone astray. Hang on, don't, don't, don't quite yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to just make sure. I'm going to double, triple check. But I believe that that is one that doesn't sound familiar and I'll know in less than 30 seconds when I double check each list of uh, which readers got which exams and which ones I've graded already. Because um, I remember saying that I didn't get as many as there were people taking the exam the night I gave it, you know, uh, live. Remember, it wasn't recorded, right? Yeah, I sent it, I mean, right when we finished it. And yeah, there's I don't doubt that. So that's why I'm trying. Hang on, there's one more place to check. And that would be ones that I've graded. Okay, and this is 2.1, of course. So, yeah, did you send it to, some people have done both and that sometimes caused confusion, but if you- Mark AOL. You did, okay, because that's another possible explanation. Okay, so I will by tomorrow evening, not sooner, late afternoon or evening, uh, get to your grade if you can resend it. I'm sure you have evidence that it was sent you know, on time, so I will count it. Uh, so resend it if you would as, now your name isn't any different, is it? The way you send it from your registered name in World? No, uh, it's yeah. not. And like, what's stopping this from not going through either? Hmm. Um, wait a minute. Um, no, I have your short paper. You got that grade, right? Yeah. But I never, I don't have a record. I'm not saying it wasn't sent or otherwise might not have gotten somehow. It doesn't matter what the reason is. I want to accommodate anyone in this, you know, situation. That's why I'm talking about this now. So in your case, just resend it tonight. I won't have probably have time to create it tonight. It's been a All right. And is there any way you can send a confirmation email? Yes, of course you would. Yeah. Well, don't hesitate to ask that and say, reminding you or remember that you can, will confirm it. If nothing else, I can confirm I got it tonight. If you send it. That would be great. Yeah, well, and then I will grade it tomorrow. How's that? Yeah, that would be great. Before six, let's say, maybe sooner. It just depends on how many other emails I have. Okay, so I'm glad I mentioned that. So if anyone else is in that situation where you, you know you send it in, but somehow you haven't heard back, uh, the only other thing is some of the midterms are sitting with readers and those I don't want to rewrite, you know, all your names out. So let's just give it to, yeah, because the confirmation thing is a separate issue from getting your grade. So my goal is before our next class, for all the people who have submitted your midterm, you should be getting your grade by email from me with an explanation if you miss more than a few points, if you got anything less than an A, uh, a more specific as, um, summation or explanation of uh, what you missed. And then you'll know, uh, oh, I did, got a few points off on this or that. Yes, please go ahead, another question. I have two questions. One question is I didn't receive your your return, my midterm uh, something. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I pretty much remember that. I think you should have had the grade because I do remember getting it. And it was graded. I can't remember if I graded it. But uh, hang on, okay. uh, hang on, because I don't want to read your grade out. That's not appropriate in, in the middle of a class, but I can tell you if um, at least it would have been. Yeah, so yours is probably with one of the readers, but hang on just a second. Don't, don't uh, like I said, my files are in two different places. So give me a moment. Um, hmm. Yeah, yours is with a reader who, by the way, uh, I am supposed to uh, get back those. That's why I was saying to people who didn't get your midterm, don't panic because 
if you want me, I, I got it. So I'm confirming with you now. Oh, okay. in your email. Oh. It's with one of my readers, very experienced reader, not a relatively new person, and uh, who took the same class, by the way. Uh, and uh, okay. at some point, I'm guessing before the weekend, I should get those. Certainly no later than the end of the weekend. You will see your grade along with everyone else. Yeah. Who's turned in. Thank yes, you. You're welcome. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, next Monday, next lesson, um, my room uh, will lose all Wi-Fi. I can't mm -hmm. get the lesson next well, month. Um, you yeah. You don't mind my asking. We've, we've communicated by email. I understand you're... I really respect this, that you're kind of having to jump over unusual hurdles to get your assignments in. And, and I appreciate that and want to accommodate. Where are you now or where will you be then? What, phys I don't mean the details, but what city? Okay. Okay, I will uh, uh, write the email to you. Okay, that's fine. You do it yeah, that way. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank because I, I can grade everything no matter where I get it from. Okay. I've gotten things from people who were traveling in Europe <laughs> or Latin America yeah. or Asia. But I've gotten your other two assignments, so uh, your paper and your midterm. So I should have no problem if you send them the same. So you're meaning you can't get on? The, yeah, you'll have to watch the uh, the YouTube video of the of the Monday lecture. Yes, yeah, yeah, and that'll be after yeah. by eight p.m. a week from Friday. This lecture, I think you've seen it all. But if you want to rewatch it or otherwise review for the fi uh, final, it, like everybody knows, each week I post all of those week's lectures on YouTube by 8 p.m. on Friday. Okay. All right, anybody else? Thank you. So, so going back, I just uh, I just forwarded you the PDF that I originally sent the day of the final. Good, I will look for it, but I can't check it right now because I'm still online. I, right. I'll send you a confirmation before 10 o'clock. Yeah, and just to make sure it's mark w at a o com. Yes, because sometimes people, I understand, even some of my family members put M. Wilson. There's someone named M. Wilson at AOL, and those won't go to me, yeah, or or Mark, you know, with another letter after it or something. Yes, it's M-A-R-K-W at AOL.com. I've had that since uh, 1996. Uh, so if you send it with the name exactly the way you were enrolled, I think you said you, you will, uh, then I should be able to not only see it and confirm it, but grade it within 24 hours. All right, thank you. You're welcome, yeah, okay. Any others, questions, uh, concerns, issues, credit? <laughs> All right, well, um, you know, next Wednesday, there are no classes, but that doesn't affect us. We have a regular class on Monday, one week from today, and your papers are uh, due three weeks from today on Monday, right? Uh, and that's, of course, the 22nd. So if you have questions in the meantime, you can email me about your papers or having me look at a sample. I think I said that at the beginning of tonight, but some people joined us late. If you send it to me more than 48 hours, it gives you plenty of time before the due date, meaning by, let's say, Friday before it's due, I can give you uh, feedback as to whether you're missing anything. But the sooner the better, of course. You should be picking a, a subject for your second paper by now, okay? Anybody else? One more time. I think we're down to the last. Okay. Good night. See you. Take care.